Next, law enforcement officials testify about the production, distribution, and use of methamphetamines and their efforts to curb the illegal trade. This hearing's just over three hours. Subcommittee will come to order. Good morning and thank you all for coming. Today we continue our subcommittee's work on the problem of methamphetamine trafficking and abuse, a problem that is ravaging the entire nation and putting a severe strain on law enforcement agencies, particularly at the state and local levels. Many of my colleagues have proposed legislation to help beleaguered law enforcement agencies deal with the meth trafficking threat. Today we hope to examine some of those proposals. Meth is one of the most powerful and dangerous drugs available, and it is also one of the easiest to make. It can be cooked using common household or agricultural chemicals and simple cold medicines, following recipes easily available on the internet. Meth comes from two major sources of supply. First, most meth, meth comes from so-called super labs in California and northern Mexico. By the end of the 1990s, these super labs produced over 70% of the nation's meth supply. Super labs are operated by large Mexican drug trafficking organizations that have used their established distribution and supply networks to transport meth throughout the country. The second major source of meth comes from small local labs that are generally unaffiliated with major trafficking organizations. These labs have proliferated throughout the country. The total amount of meth actually supplied by these labs is comparatively small. However, the environmental damage and health hazard they create makes them a serious problem for local communities, particularly the state and local law enforcement agencies charged with the duty to uncover and clean them up. In my home state of Indiana, for example, more than 20% of the labs raided by police were discovered only after the labs had exploded and started fires. Children are often found at these meth labs and have frequently suffered from severe health problems as a result of hazardous chemicals used in drug manufacturing. Robberies and violence in local communities as drug dealers and uh, 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 other uh, people seeking money, uh, the addicts continue to commit criminal acts in order to obtain uh, precursor chemicals and also money to fund their habits. So this has uh, been closely related to other crime in the local communities, uh, much more so than the super labs. During this Congress, we have held field hearings, not only uh, we've held hearings here in Washington, but we've also held field hearings across the country, in Indiana to Hawaii, uh, the Deep South, uh, the Northwest, examining the meth epidemic. Everywhere we go, we hear about many of the same issues. In particular, we have heard about the high costs and long hours required for law enforcement agencies to hunt down, investigate, and clean up dangerous meth lab sites while dealing with the heartbreaking cases of children exposed to drugs and chemicals and in need of emergency medical care and a safe place to go. Where meth is a problem, this drug is probably the single biggest drain on local law enforcement resources in the country. We will need to take action at every level, federal, state, and local, to respond to this problem. At other hearings, we have addressed the question of treatment and prevention, and Congress will, of course, need to deal with them. At this hearing, however, we need to focus, we intend to focus on law enforcement side, specifically what we in Congress can do to help sheriffs and police departments across the nation deal with meth. Uh, we also, uh, the whole meth process started uh, in this subcommittee about uh, probably close to six years ago in California where we started with the super lab problem and we've increasingly moved to look at the local law enforcement problem which will be a little more the focus of, of this hearing. Congressional proposals to assist local uh, law enforcement have taken two basic forms. First, regulations designed to reduce the supply of precursor chemicals used to make meth. And second, direct financial assistance to state and local agencies to support anti-meth enforcement. I will briefly discuss each of these concepts. First, what is the best way to, ed to reduce the supply of meth precursor chemicals such as pseudofedrin? Presumably, if we can substantially reduce the availability of meth components, the number of small meth labs will be reduced as well. There are several proposals currently on the table intended to do just that. One idea is to eliminate the federal blister pack exemption for pseudoephedrine sales. Under current law, retailers can sell unlimited quantities of pseudoephedrine as long as it is packaged in blister packs. Sadly, these blister packs have not been much of a hindrance to meth cooks. I believe the exemption should be eliminated and have proposed legislation, H.R. 5347, which would do just that. A second approach is to put pseudoephedrine and similar chemicals on Schedule 5 of the Controlled Substances Act. 
This would force retailers to sell cold medicines and similar products be from behind the counter and may also force consumers to show identification and sign a register when purchasing such products. It may also prevent non-pharmacists from selling cold medicines. Oklahoma recently enacted this approach into law and several other states are planning to do the same. In this uh, session of Congress, Oklahoma Congressman Brad Carson proposed legislation which would do this on a nationwide scale. Finally, a third approach takes aim at the importation and sale of bulk quantities of pseudoephedrine. According to a recent report in the Oregonian newspaper, most of the world's supply of pseudoephedrine comes from just a few factories in Europe, uh, where we've, by the way, this subcommittee has been both in uh, at Rotterdam and Antwerp and uh, pressured aggressively European authorities to crack down on the pseudoephedrine shipment, uh, which has traditionally been our supply as well as working with the Canadians. Uh, but uh, uh, much of this has now moved to India and China. It might be possible to stop most chemical diversion even before these products reach the sh uh, shores of the United States and the stores in the United States if we can put pressures on the trade. Import quotas, international cooperation, and regulations of the wholesale markets are all possible ways of reducing the availability of precursor chemicals to meth traffickers. With respect to any new regulation of meth precursors, Congress needs to ask several questions. First, how effective will the new regulation be at reducing the supply of precursors and the number of meth labs? Second, what will be the impact on legitimate sellers and consumers of these products? How much inconvenience do we want to impose on people who just want to buy cold medicines? And finally, how effective will the regulations passed only in one state be if all the other states don't follow suit? Do we need a national standard? The second set of proposals involves federal grants and other financial assistance to state and local law enforcement agencies. Currently, the federal government provides significant assistance to state and local agencies through several grant programs, including the Burn Grants and the COPS Meth Hotspots Grants, administered by the Department of Justice, and the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas HIDA program, administered by the Office of National Drug Control Policy, ONDCP. State and local law enforcement officials have repeatedly told me and my staff that these grants are vital to their drug enforcement and particularly their meth enforcement efforts. Several members of Congress, including Missouri Congressman and Majority Whip Roy Blunt and my subcommittee colleague from California, Congressman Doug Osi, have proposed expanding these programs to deal with the meth threat. The administration, however, has proposed significant cuts in these programs, particularly the burn grants. Before deciding whether to expand, contract, or significantly retailer these programs, Congress needs to have a better understanding of what they do and how effective they are. This hearing will address these difficult questions and hopefully help lay the groundwork for legislative action in the next Congress. Our first panel of witnesses have joined us to discuss the federal government's response to the meth problem. Mr. Scott Burns, Deputy Director of the State and Local Affairs at the Office of National Drug Control Policy, who has taken a lead role in addressing meth issues. Mr. Domingo Haraz, a Director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance at the Justice Department's Office of Justice, Justice Programs, which is responsible for administering many of the federal grant proposals at issue today. And Mr. Joseph Ranasizi, uh, close. <laughs> uh, Deputy Chief of the Office of Enforcement at the Drug Enforcement Administration, which is not only responsible for coordinating the federal government's meth enforcement efforts, but also for administering the federal government's meth cleanup assistance program for state and local agencies. For the record, the subcommittee invited the U.S. Coast Guard to testify at this hearing concerning the trafficking of Southeast Asian uh, methamphetamine, also called Yaba, and the movement of precursor chemicals into this country from Asia. The Coast Guard declined to testify about their knowledge of these issues. The subcommittee will ask the Coast Guard in writing about questions regarding Southeast Asian meth and the movement of precursor chemicals. At a hearing like this, it is vitally important for us to hear from the state and local agencies forced to fight on the front lines against meth and other illegal drugs. We welcome Mr. Lonnie Wright, Director of the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, who will talk to us today about his state's new anti-meth law. Sheriff Steve Bundy of the Rice County, Kansas Sheriff's Department, my fellow Hoosier, Lieutenant George Colby, Division Commander and Project Director of the Allen County Drug Task Force at the Allen County Sheriff's Department. We also welcome three representatives of manufacturers and retailers of pseudoephedrine products who will help us understand the impact that new regulations may have on businesses and consumers. We are joined by Mr. Joseph Herons, Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at Marsh Supermarkets on behalf of the Food Marketing Institute, Dr. 
uh, Linda Sudam, President of the Consumer Healthcare Products Association, and Ms. Marianne Wagner, Vice President for Pharmacy Regulatory Affairs at the National Association of Chain Drug Stores. We thank everyone for taking the time to join us this morning and look forward to your testimony. Now I yield to the distinguished ranking member, Mr. Elijah Cummings. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for holding this hearing and for your attention to this important issue of methamphetamine abuse in the United States and our efforts to fight it. Methamphetamine is a dangerous, highly addictive, and sometimes deadly illegal drug, the increasing use of which has created a serious drug epidemic in our country. Once concentrated in the Western United States and among particular population subgroups, the use of meth has spread geographically, has become more broadly popular, and appears to be increasing among young adults in particular. Significant changes in patterns of meth trafficking and production have contributed to the epidemic while increasing the challenge to anti-meth law enforcement efforts. The adverse impact of the meth problem is not limited to the serious negative effects on health and the general well-being of its users. Because meth use leads to violent and erratic behavior, it fuels serious crime problems in areas where meth use is prevalent, and meth production can result in deadly explosions and substantial environmental damage. For these reasons, the spread of meth production and use creates severe burdens for the government agencies that must deal with the consequences. And on that note, I want to thank all of our witnesses who on a day-to-day -day basis work so hard to address the drug problems in this country. Uh, as one who has seen the effects of the drug epidemic and has seen the people that it has destroyed, the neighborhoods and the families, I thank you for what you're trying to do. I know it is an awesome task. Anti-meth efforts have become an increasing focus for federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies in various parts of the country, including through the high-intensity drug trafficking areas program and other joint law enforcement task force. We will hear today from representatives of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Office of Justice Programs, and the drug law enforcement officials from Indiana, Kansas and Oklahoma about how law enforcement is responding to the trends in meth production, trafficking and use, and to the costly consequences of these activities. And the chairman did mention um, the fact that we will be hearing about the federal government's response. Uh, one of the things I'm also interested in hearing is when we, uh, I read about the, some of the state uh, laws that have been put in effect. and. I'd like to hear recommendations as to whether other states should be doing the same things or perhaps whether the federal government should step up their role in regard to those issues. Uh, I, when I read about one of them, I immediately wrote my st state legislature, my favorite state legislator. You know, you always got to have somebody to carry your water in the state government um, and said, look, you ought to put this into effect. You ought to make sure you uh, uh, file this. Uh, come January when our legislature comes in, in, into being. And so we want to know that. Because meth is frequently manufactured from common, readily available products such as over-the-counter coal and cough medicines, it presents unique policy problems. Beginning with the Comprehensive Methamphetamine Control Act of 1996, Congress has responded with legislation to increase penalties for meth-related crimes and tighten controls on retail sales of products containing pseudofedrine and related chemicals. Several proposals introduced in the 108th Congress would place further restrictions on the sale of over-the-counter products used in meth productions, and Mr. Souter has gone over some of them. Clearly, the meth epidemic presents a difficult set of challenges for law enforcement policymakers. I hope today's hearing will enhance our understanding of the challenges and shed some light on what further action should take what we should take to address the problem. And I want all of our witnesses to know that <clears throat> this is indeed a bipartisan subcommittee, and we share a lot of concerns with regard to drugs. Um, and we have worked very hard to, to make sure that government works effectively and efficiently using the taxpayers' dollars to address those problems. And so um, we welcome you, we thank you, and um, 
with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Micah. Well, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member, uh, I thank you for uh, convening this uh, hearing today uh, on uh, law enforcement's uh, efforts and the administration's efforts uh, to fight uh, the scourge of uh, meth abuse and misuse uh, of illegal narcotics. Uh, uh, Having participated on this panel for some time, um, and I, I think I just heard the chairman recall a hearing that we held in California uh, when we saw the beginning of this uh, problem um, in our country. I think I uh, was never so shocked as uh, some of the testimony we heard. I think uh, one was, uh, of a mother who uh, put her baby in a microwave uh, when she was on meth. And uh, we'd heard social workers talking about uh, dozens of children that had been abandoned because their parents or, or guardian was uh, uh, hooked on uh, meth. Uh, it made me realize that uh, we had a, a very insidious problem and also a problem that uh, that ne needed a, a multifaceted approach, and I'm pleased the administration has, a, I guess, what they've called a National Synthetic Drugs Action Plan. One of the realizations uh, uh, from that hearing and from that time was that uh, it take, it's, it's going to take a combination of effort. It's not just uh, enforcement, which is important. It's not just interdiction of the chemicals, uh, because Meth can be produced um, uh, with uh, off-the-shelf uh, uh, ingredients. Uh, it's going to take uh, education uh, and, uh, and uh, treatment uh, efforts. Uh, and I think people really don't realize, and uh, unfortunately, that hearings like this uh, can tell the damage that this is doing. Uh, you look at, um, right now, we're we're in the 20,000 range per year of uh, individuals who die from uh, drug overdose uh, deaths. 20,000 Americans. It's a phenomenal number. It's a, a silent uh, deaths, uh, but uh, that, that's only those from drug overdose. You're not talking about the murders, the suicides. You're not talking about the human toll, uh, the families that are in total uh, uh, total chaos uh, and individual lives that are destroyed uh, uh, through narcotics. This is indeed our biggest uh, social problem, the biggest problem in our society today is um, a problem of illegal narcotics and now led by uh, the meth uh, epidemic. So I think you're holding uh, the hearing today uh, is important. I think that the uh, plan that's been proposed, plan of action, is uh, important, and I think that we need to uh, provide whatever resources uh, are necessary in a concerted effort to uh, to deal again with um, uh, this whole situation. So, I thank you. I look forward to uh, working with you and uh, applaud your efforts uh, today in bringing this to the attention of the subcommittee and Congress. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Do you have any opening comments? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate this hearing. Uh, it's not the first hearing we've had on uh, methamphetamine, and I think the fact that we've had more than one hearing points up the concern of the committee and the Congress about the rapid spread of this, this drug, which, uh, whose effects are, are quite pervasive, not only on individuals, uh, but on the environment itself, because these labs uh, require extensive uh, cleanup uh, after they are brought down. Uh, I, uh, look, I, I recognize that uh, drugs of choice differ based on location in the country, uh, and that uh, in big cities uh, you don't hear as much about meth. You hear about very dangerous drugs, but not meth, and it's interesting. I guess whoever establishes a niche 
it becomes the, 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 that becomes the drug of that locale. Uh, but I asked about meth in the nation's capital. Uh, and, I, and yes, uh, I, to be sure, uh, it's a kind of drug where, uh, where the existence of labs and the like uh, do not lend themselves as readily uh, to bringing it into the middle of a, a big city. But, and so it, it's not a major problem here yet. I'm, I'm very concerned that we catch it because who it is a major problem with are teenagers and young adults. And we know about uh, the use of uh, young adults uh, and the distribution at raves and at nightclubs of meth and meth uh, type uh, drugs. So, so I'm particularly concerned uh, about the age group uh, that is involved and that this could sweep uh, everywhere. We need to, we already it seems to me have uh, uh, have a major problem with with meth, uh, but it, se it, it 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 would appear to me that it has a, a real attraction uh, on a on a national level. There are a number of bills that have been pending for some time in the Congress. The first time we took, I think, significant uh, the last time we took significant action was in the 106th Congress. I don't believe these bills are terribly controversial. I certainly hope some of them will come to the floor, uh, for example, uh, a bill that would uh, require that certain of the uh, ingredients that can be used to make meth, which are readily available um, in a um, store or a drug store, be kept behind the pharmacy, uh, behind the counter of the pharmacy, so that you'd have to make your purchase over the counter and show identification and sign a log. I think these are the kind of minimal steps that the Congress should take at the same time that we're saying to uh, drug enforcement officers around the country, why don't you clean it up? We need to do all we can and perhaps much more to help you clean it up. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Tiberi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for having this hearing today. It's a real pleasure to have a constituent of mine on the panel. Uh, and friend, Domingo Jerez, has uh, in the past uh, served Ohio as the, uh, the man in charge of the Criminal Justice Service Office in Ohio. Great reputation, did a great job. I know Ohio misses you, but thank you for your, your uh, work here in Washington and your service to our country. I yield back. Thank you. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is uh, a hearing that I think will uh, help us be more effective in working with you and our local law enforcement on this um, very uh, critical um, issue of methamphetamine. I just had uh, some law enforcement in my office on, on Monday from our uh, Minnesota Police and uh, Peace Officers Association. And we have taken some of the steps to work towards reducing the number of small labs. Uh, prompts come up when Sudafed is, is purchased in that. But uh, law enforcement was sharing with, with me that the bigger problem, and it's in the testimony that's before us today, is really from the major labs that are producing um, uh, methamphetamine in very large quantities. Law enforcement spoke of three generations of, uh, of methamphetamine um, abusers in one family are now arresting the grandchildren of, of meth users. So this, this, is a, this is a very serious problem which needs to be um, looked at. The, the filling up of our prisons in Minnesota as we do make um, arrests, the lack of any kind of treatment that is proven to uh, help people who do want to change their life around is, is very serious. But I think the issue that concerned me most was the first responders and they're concerned about their own personal health. And so I think if this is the part of the war on drugs, we need to come up with protocols for what type of equipment will be available for rural, urban, and suburban uh, first responders. What's the protocol when we find children uh, for um, their, their health, well-being, uh, which affects uh, their ability to be good learners in school. And what we're going to do for our first responders uh, for their health. Um, we are now starting to see retirements uh, come about as uh, people have literally had uh, their lungs destroyed when they've encountered labs 
uh, that they didn't know that they were walking into. So, Mr. Chair, I appreciate the hearing and I look forward to working on this very important issue. Thank you. Judge Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I started, first encountered Speed back in uh, 1981 as a trial judge. We dealt with it a lot. Uh, I had an experience that I'll share with you. One time I, we had a bunch of trustees that were moving furniture in, uh, in the courthouse, and I was just listening to their conversation. And I discovered something that's very interesting. Uh, going to prison is the cost of doing business in that in that in that in the drug manufacturing business. Uh, if going to prison is not uh, too harsh, and the profits are great, then uh, the results are that it's just the cost of doing business, and two three years is not bad when you're making a million bucks a year. Uh, so you just take your time and go back, and you're back in business in 30 days, and everything's wonderful. Now we weren't dealing with the super labs that you're dealing with today. We were dealing with the mom and pop operations, uh, but first off, a, a, an information program went out through local papers about the, the problems with meth and the problems with speed and, and what happens when, when, when kids get on it. And then the jury showed up and started issuing punishment, because in Texas you get to go to the jury for punishment, and people discovered that maximum sentences with it, uh, for those people who were manufacturing methamphetamine resulted, at least in our county, of no manufacture of methamphetamine. Methamphetamine generally in those days was, was, was manufactured in the suburban counties around the urban areas, uh, and we happen to f qualify as one of those suburban counties around Austin being the urban area. They weren't cooking meth in, in Austin. They were cooking meth in, in Williamson County and Bastrop County and Hayes County and Burnett County that surrounded Austin. Uh, within 60 days, we didn't cook. There weren't anybody, wasn't anybody cooking in Williamson County because everybody that got caught was going to prison for 20 years and up. Uh, and ultimately, that problem got solved in our at least area because everybody started looking at what happened. So I want to I want to know what we're doing in the way of punishing people who are manufacturing this stuff uh, because I happen to believe that punishment. If the cost of good going, doing business gets great enough, uh, on, the, on the mom and pop labs at least, the, the speed labs go elsewhere. Uh, and uh, then ultimately we need to know what's being done uh, internationally on these people that are cooking out of this country and, and the harshness that we're dealing with those people who are transpo transporting into this country large volumes of this, uh, these drugs. Because I think that also has a cost of doing business effect on drug trafficking. Uh, I agree with everything that everyone says about the issue of treating people, uh, but the bottom line is education and making the business difficult, in my opinion, is the key to cleaning up the drug business. And so I'd like to hear your ideas on some of those things. And I thank you very much for being willing to come here and share with me, us. Thank you. This, uh, we're going to insert into the record this uh, tremendous Oregonian newspaper series, Unnecessary Epidemic, uh, that um, it uh, show, has a very interesting map that shows, uh, as this committee has watched it over the years, the track from west to east of the meth problem, starting in Hawaii, which has the oldest and deepest. We're now in the city of Honolulu. Uh, some apartment complexes require cleaning prior to taking occupancy because the leftover meth chemicals from the labs poison the children in the next group that comes in. Uh, that uh, We've seen it in the West Coast moving to the Midwest. You can tell by the request for field hearings to this committee that right now outstanding from members to me for, to this committee are from Kansas, uh, Missouri, uh, Kentucky, Southern Indiana, Tennessee, and to North Carolina. And the hearing requests tend to come as it's moving east. We get the request from that group of, of members, and you can see the intensity of the problem coming. In the Speaker's Drug Task Force, it is the number one subject that comes up. The members from North Carolina showed in, up in mass last time uh, regarding the uh, meth uh, problem. Uh, as it, it's moved east, as we've held the field hearings, we've seen the first signs of it coming into motels and other things in New Orleans and into southeast Detroit, uh, which would be the first hit in the, some of the largest cities, because up till now it tends to have been a rural phenomena 
and to some degree moving into the suburbs, if it hits the cities, it could be like a crack ed epidemic, which is why we really need to, to work at both the rural and the urban side and understand that this is something that is a uh, widening threat, and when it hits a district, the member of Congress in that district, it becomes the number one issue in his district beyond any other narcotics issue. Um, uh, with that, uh, we'll have a few other things we're going to insert, but before proceeding, I want to uh, I want to take uh, care of a couple of procedural matters. First, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to submit written statements and questions for the hearing record, that any answers to written questions provided by the witnesses also be included in the record. Without objection, it's so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that all exhibits, documents, and other materials referred to by members and the witnesses may be included in the hearing record, and that all members may be permitted to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection, it is so ordered. Now, uh, the, our first panel, Mr. Burns, Mr. Raz, and Mr. Renazasi, um, we'll get that clarified when I introduce you. But if you'll stand, raise your right hand, I'll administer the oath. It's a tradition of this committee, as you know, uh, because it's an oversight committee that we uh, a standard practice to ask all witnesses to testify under the oath. Do you swear the testimony you give today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. Mr. Scott Burns, Deputy Director at ONDCP, and we're also going to insert in the record your uh, National Synthetic Drugs Action Plan as we work to uh, prepare uh, the, um, uh, as we look into the next session of what we can do here in Congress. This will give us a good layout. You've done a good job of pulling that together, and we look forward to hearing your summary of those remarks and what you've been uh, working on in this area, and thank you for your leadership at the state and local level. Well, thank you, Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the efforts to reduce the problem of methamphetamine in America. I appreciate this subcommittee's long-standing support of the Office of National Drug Control Policies and our efforts against illegal drug use. The problem of methamphetamine use, distribution, and production, as you know and have discussed, is one with which I am also well acquainted. I was a prosecutor in rural Utah for some 16 years uh, before being confirmed in my present position. Methamphetamine use in labs can take a significant toll on communities, but I'm pleased to report that there is good news on the horizon. As discussed in the administration's newly released National Synthetic Drugs Action Plan, there are things we can do that we know will make the methamphetamine problem smaller and that we intend to pursue over the next four years. My written testimony discusses this in greater detail and I request it be made part of the record. Our approach to methamphetamine must be market-based, focusing both on the supply and demand of the drug. Reducing the supply of methamphetamine is best accomplished by destroying the ability of methamphetamine cooks, both large and small, to make the final product. And this means making the acquisition of chemicals used to cook methamphetamine even harder than it is now. One of our successes in this area is Operation Northern Star, which is a DEA-led initiative to cut off the supply to super labs of pseudoephedrine, the key ingredient, again, as you know, used to make meth. By focusing on the diversion of these chemicals from Canada to domestic super labs, we have now seen a shrinking in the number of super labs within the United States, and that's good news. However, we believe that some of these super labs are being pushed south of our borders to Mexico. And for this reason, we will continue to work with our international partners, such as the Fox administration, to stop the flow uh, of these chemicals into Mexico. And we fully support the efforts of the Fox administration to become more effective in controlling the methamphetamine threat in Mexico. In addition to the efforts of federal law enforcement, we continue to be focused on disrupting the domestic market for methamphetamine. Uh, for example, the percentage of Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, or OCDETH, investigations in which at least one of the drugs involved included methamphetamine has steadily increased uh, from 19.2 percent in fiscal year 2001 to 26.7 percent in FY04. And additionally, among the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, or HIDA, initiatives that focus predominantly on a single drug, more have focused on methamphetamine than any other drug. And most of the remaining initiatives, which were polydrug in nature, included a methamphetamine focus. Among the many recommendations of the administration's synthetic drug action plan are those designed to cut off access by methamphetamine producers to precursors such as pseudoephedrine. These include a lowering of the federal limit on single sales of pseudoephedrine products and removing the so-called blister pack exemption that currently exists in federal law. 
Federal legislation will be necessary to implement some of the recommendations set forth in the action plan, and we look forward to working with you to identify the right solutions. Additionally, some states have focused on limiting not only the amount of pseudoephedrine products that may be purchased, but also the location and manner in which the product may be purchased, and have imposed additional requirements for the process of the purchase itself. Over the next several months, we will be closely analyzing the data and results in states where these innovative measures have been implemented. Many of these state actions were taken in the recent past, so over the next several months, we will seek the best data and information possible to highlight which of those approaches are the most effective in reducing methamphetamine availability and lab numbers. In conclusion, as with the drug issue as a whole, it is important to remember that drug trafficking and production respond to effective supply and demand reduction measures. And the administration looks forward to working with Congress to effectuate a lasting reduction of the methamphetamine problem in America. I look forward to your questions. And again, thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Domingo Hariz, is that correct? Uh, who's the uh, Director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance Office of Justice Programs of the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, arguably the uh, most important agency to a lot of our local uh, state and police uh, agencies. We appreciate you coming today and look forward to your testimony. Uh, will you uh, tap your uh, mic? My bad. Thank you. Thanks. Chairman Souder and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to be here this morning before the subcommittee to discuss how the Office of Justice Programs provides support in addressing the problems of methamphetamine abuse, manufacturing, and trafficking in the United States. As requested by the committee, I will also discuss the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services, the COPS Office, and their meth programs. As we continue to combat the deadly scourge of methamphetamine, I want to point out that our overall effort in fighting crime is succeeding. I'm pleased to report to you that the violent crime rate is the lowest in 30 years. For the first time in a decade, we have seen teenage drug use fall across all the boards uh, with the 8th, 10th, and 12th grade. Although we are encouraged by this data, if we want to decline, we want to continue the decline uh, in crime, we realize we must remain committed to preventing crime and holding accountable those who violate our laws. As BJ Director, I now focus on the problems associated with meth from a national perspective. However, in my previous position as director of the Ohio Office of Criminal Justice Services, I saw firsthand the toll that meth has had on Ohio families and children, as well as the Ohio criminal justice system. Mr. Chairman, as we both know, coming from heartland states, the problems associated with meth production, distribution, and abuse is of grave concern to rural areas. Through various BJ funding sources, law enforcement agencies across the country are addressing the prevention and treatment of meth abuse, as well as the production, distribution, and exposure risks to officers and citizens. Meth task forces and other anti-drug efforts to investigate and prosecute drug crimes, as well as work diligently to ensure law enforcement officers' safety while encountering meth labs. BJ also provides valuable training and technical assistance to law enforcement on task force management and investigation. One of our primary funding sources for supporting efforts to fight meth abuse is the Edward Byrne Memorial State and Local Law Enforcement Assistance Program, which is a partnership amongst federal, state, and local governments to create safer communities. Through Byrne, BJ awards grants to, to states for use by the states and units of local government to improve their functioning of the criminal justice system. In fiscal year 2003 alone, at least eight states and partnering local communities made use of $2.76 million in burn program funds for anti-meth efforts. For example, in Tennessee, burn funds were used to support both meth investigation and trafficking efforts, as well as prevention efforts. In Oregon, burn funds were used to support two different regional drug task forces for meth lab seizures, as well as disruption of street-level distribution. A methamphetamine response team was funded in Kentucky and Kansas use burn funds to support the development of intensive supervision and treatment alternatives to meth abusers and offenders. The Bureau of Justice Assistance, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Office for Community Oriented Policing Services prepared a program level environmental assessment governing meth lab operations. Officers face unknown exposure, as you have already mentioned, when responding to homes, hotel rooms, vehicles, and other places where meth is being produced or consumed. In addition, when the immediate exposure risks are mitigated, the problem isn't gone. Officers and departments 
must then decide what to do with a vehicle, a home, a hotel room uh, that would normally be soon returned to its owners or occupied or used by other consumers, even though contamination may still be at unacceptable levels. Our assessment describes the adverse environmental health and safety impacts likely to be encountered by law enforcement agencies as they implement specific actions under their meth lab operations. Another BJA support, source of support for these efforts to combat meth abuse is the local law enforcement block grant program, which provides funds to units of local government to underwrite, underwrite projects that reduce crime and improve public safety. The LLLEBG program, as it is referenced, allows funds to be used for various type of meth responses, including establishing multi-jurisdictional task forces, paying for law enforcement overtime, and acquiring specialized uh, equipment. The funds can also be used to cover or defray costs of insurance for hazardous assignments, as may be required with this issue. In fiscal year 2004, LLEBG funds supported 12 projects in nine states, including Kentucky, Oregon, Texas, and Washington. For example, in Richmond, Kentucky funded equipment purchases for a meth lab trailer that is used to process meth labs encountered within the county. Marion County, Oregon funded No Meth, Not My Neighborhood program, and Washington County, also in Oregon, launched an anti-methamphetamine education campaign. Corpus Christi, Texas purchased meth responses for protective gear for its officers. Thurston County, Washington provided overtime for its officers to support anti-methamphetamine efforts with, within the county. The administration has proposed replacing the burn and LLEG, LLEBG grant programs with a new more flexible burn justice assistance grant program in 2005. As you, as you can see by these various funds, both law enforcement block grant, the, the uh, uh, burn program, both could be utilized for prevention, education, enforcement, and prosecution efforts. The drug court discretionary grant program is another BJ administered program which is a valuable resource for communities experiencing methamphetamine problems. Drug courts can assist those who abuse meth and other drugs by providing treatment, drug testing, sanctions, and transitional services to offenders. In addition to BJ's grant programs, I am placing an emphasis on providing training and technical assistance with regard to the complexities of the meth production and abuse. Just this past October, BJ, along with the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and the Alliance for Model State Drug Laws, a BJA grantee, sponsored a national methamphetamine legislative and policy conference. The summit produced concrete strategies and raised awareness regarding additional work we need to do to comprehensively attack methamphetamine throughout the nation. Through the Center for Task Force Training, BJA provides training to law enforcement on basic investigation techniques and basic uh, drug task force management issues such as personnel selection, handling confidential information, informants, and raid planning. After hearing from law enforcement about their need for additional training, we have more than tripled our number of meth amphetamine training courses offered nationwide for a total of up to 12 courses. These courses are offered at the state level for the state themselves to then bring in local law enforcement uh, to uh, uh, provide them the opportunity to be trained. Uh, most recently, uh, we'll be scheduled a course in actually in Virginia as the first pilot of this project. Other components of the Office of Justice program are also addressing meth use and serving its victims. For example, the National Institute on Justice is working on a comprehensive review of methamphetamine-related research that will uh, identify lessons learned about enforcement and treatment, as well as research gaps that need to be addressed. The Office for Victims of Crime has a bulletin available called Children at Clandestine Met uh, Methamphetamine Labs Helping Meth's Youngest Victims. It explains that the best way to help these children is through coordinated multidisciplinary efforts, such as medical and mental health treatment services, child protective services, law enforcement, prosecution, and public safety officials. As the subcommittee is aware, the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services, also known as COPS, operates the COPS methamphetamine program. The program is intended to support um, state and local clandestine lab cleanup efforts in 2005. The administration requests $20 million for that purpose. Available on the COPS website is a problem-solving guide on clandestine lab, drug labs and an evaluation of the COPS meth program. The guide is intended to help law enforcement develop proactive prevention strategies and to improve the overall response to these incidents. The evaluation assesses the effectiveness of the community policing strategies employed by the various jurisdictions funded by the COPS office under the methamphetamine program in fiscal year 1998. 
The evaluation report indicates successes among those agencies employing coordinated proactive intervention tactics, including targeted enforcement strategies, coupled with police and community awareness training regarding the production and distribution of the drug. Even though these collective efforts from OJP and COPS are helping address the nation's meth problem, we recognize we need to work harder with all of our state and local partners to ensure that resources are used effectively and efficiently. Through our conferences, we have learned from the field that they would be better served by having a centralized resource, a portal, if you will, for information on meth abuse and strategies, including law enforcement and prosecution strategies, environmental briefs, research summaries, and funding information, and BJ is creating it. We appreciate the interest that you and your colleagues have shown in this critical drug abuse issue. I welcome the opportunity to answer your questions. As it relates to the Office of Justice programs, I would request that any questions related to COPS program be submitted to the COPS office in writing. Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness is Mr. Joseph Ranazisi, uh, who's the, uh, well, that was an accident, but I tried. Uh, but I appreciate uh, your work as the Deputy Chief Office of Enforcement of DEA. DEA plays an increasingly not only internationally important role, but in the United States, uh, working with our local drug task forces and so on. And uh, I'm glad you came to testify today and look forward to your testimony. Thank you very much, sir. Chairman Souter, Ranking Member Cummings, uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee and fellow panel members, on behalf of Administrator Karen Tandy, I appreciate your invitation to testify today on the importance of law enforcement's fight against methamphetamine. Until the late 1980s, methamphetamine's popularity was primarily confined to the West Coast and Southwest. By the early 1990s, methamphetamine was gaining in popularity, spreading West to East across the country and hitting rural areas particularly hard. No community is immune. There are three distinct components to combating the overall methamphetamine problem. First, enforcement. Second, a comprehensive domestic and international precursor control program. And third, the identification and cleanup of, growing, of the growing number of small toxic labs, which we call STLs. As a result of our efforts and those of our law enforcement partners across the country and in Canada since 2001, the U.S. has seen a 79 percent decrease in the seizure of super labs. Enforcement efforts have also led to an 85 percent reduction in the amount of pseudoephedrine ephedrine and other methamphetamine precursors seized at the Canadian border, and the price of black market pseudoephedrine in California has doubled. Internationally, the DEA is working with our foreign counterparts to prevent the diversion of pseudoephedrine from Europe, China, and India to methamphetamine producing countries. Specialized training is required to safely and effectively conduct these investigations, and our Office of Training has developed a program for our agents, state and local officers, and our foreign counterparts. Since fiscal year 2000, we've provided basic clandestine laboratory training certification to over 6,100 state and local law enforcement officers. Additionally, we are providing clandestine lab awareness training to approximately 17,000 students per year. Heightened enforcement efforts have resulted in a dramatic increase throughout the country. To properly dispose of resulting waste, the DEA has enlisted the services of the private sector to help clean up these lab sites. The DEA's Hazardous Waste Program, with the assistance of the COPS program, supports and funds the cleanup of a majority of the laboratories seized in the U.S. Though the number of cleanups has increased more than 4,000 percent, the average cost per cleanup has continued to decrease. In addition to the drain on law enforcement resources, the demands on medical, social, environmental, and public health and safety services continue to grow. STLs account for the vast majority of clandestine labs and are often discovered in areas where children live and play. These STLs also generate toxic waste, which is frequently discharged on the ground, into the waterways, or down the drain. Clearly, given the problem of this magnitude, there is a need for new approaches and strong regulatory controls on precursor chemicals used to manufacture methamphetamine. The regulation of ephedrine and pseudoephedrine is a vital overall strategy to combat methamphetamine abuse. State legislative measures have focused on limiting the amount of pseudoephedrine products that may be purchased, the location and manner in which the product may be purchased, the re requirements for the process and purchase itself. 
Because state action regulating methamphetamine precursors is a recent development, the administration will wait for better data and information to emerge before commenting on the effectiveness and impact of any particular action in reducing methamphetamine availability or methamphetamine laboratory numbers and how they relate to federal policy. The administration recently released the National Synthetic Drug Action Plan. In doing so, the Department of Justice, ONDCP, and DEA proclaim the seriousness of the challenges posed by methamphetamine, along with other synthetic drugs and diverted pharmaceuticals, as well as our resolve to confront these challenges. The action plan outlines specific steps that the federal government will take to accelerate our national efforts against these harmful substances. The DEA is energetically combating our national methamphetamine epidemic on several fronts. We are engaged in aggressive enforcement, comprehensive domestic and international precursor chemical control, the identification of cleanup of the growing number of STLs, and providing clandestine laboratory training to our law enforcement partners as well as our foreign counterparts. In addition to our efforts in these areas, we also believe that stricter regulatory controls of precursor chemicals is one of the most effective tools available to assist in the fight against illicit methamphetamine production. Thank you for your recognition of this important issue and the opportunity to testify here today. I look forward to answering your questions. Any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want the um, record to show, too, that what our committee's finding is, is that the national EPIC number of 17,000 is tremendously understated. Uh, in uh, northeast Indiana alone, in talking with our sheriffs, the number in my district exceeds the number for the state. Uh, and in Arkansas, in northwest Arkansas, they had more than was reported for their entire state. And in meetings that we had with Congressman Alexandra in Monroe, Louisiana, and Alexandria, Louisiana, with about 30 to 50 sheriffs and prosecutors, they just dwarf the numbers that are reported. It doesn't appear that any one state is off. It, it's, it's a process, but I think that explains some of the political pressure that we're hearing because somehow our numbers aren't matching uh, in the uh, reporting, and I think it's just a lot of them are very small. Local police is so overwhelmed. Uh, in, in my district, we can't build enough jails to put the meth addicts in. Every single county outside of uh, Allen County, where Fort Wayne is, has uh, the majority of their jail spots filled right now with meth addicts. Uh, and the second they let them out, they're right back in it. They're the most immune group to treatment that we've faced in any of our uh, drug questions right now, and it's partly why we're feeling this uh, uh, political pressure. But first, I, I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Burns and Mr. Ranazisi, do you, on the, on the small meth labs, uh, what is the main source of precursor supply? Do you feel they're buying it from pharmacies or stealing it? Do they get the anhydrous ammonia and other solvents by buying them or stealing them? Well, let's talk about the anhydrous ammonia first. <laughs> Extremely dangerous chemical used in farming, a necessary necessary tool for farmers. Um, basically, they're, they're stealing it. They're walking in, you know, looking at nurse tanks that are on farmland, waiting late at night, walking onto the farmland, tapping into the nurse tank, an extremely dangerous, dangerous situation. And hydrous ammonia is, is a terrible, terrible chemical as far as inhalation. Uh, severe medical damage to the lungs. Uh, there's been countless reports of police officers and people being injured and killed, uh, citizens being killed because of uh, anhydrous. Uh, if you remember correctly, I believe it was last year, there was a meth lab operator who tapped into a high pressure anhydrous line in Florida. Uh, it was a pipeline. Uh, it scorched 500 acres of land. I believe two residential developments were evacuated in a school. Um, Obviously, they need the chemical, and they go after the chemical that way. What about the pseudoephedrine? Pseudoephedrine is available in all different markets. Uh, obviously, we, we, we've, I believe we've done a very good job in stopping the bulk flow across the Canadian border. We do know that pseudoephedrine still is, is sent out from, as you said, the European countries in China, um, India, uh, and there's that sector of bulk pseudoephedrine. There's also the retail sector. Uh, obviously, you could walk into pharmacies and buy pseudoephedrine. There's you no could, reason to steal it if you can buy it over the counter. Right. I, there are reports where people have done sweeps where they've actually walked into pharmacies with shopping bags, just swept the whole shelf, put them in the bag, and ran out the store. 
I mean, there's, there's serious concerns about stealing as well. Uh, the profit margin is so high, though. I mean, if you think about it, why would you want to steal it and get caught when you could purchase it? You know, we could smurf it, go to five, six, seven pharmacies or other areas, purchase it, and make your methamphetamine. Because a lot of the mom and pop people are cooking for themselves, or maybe two people, and they don't. They can buy it. It's only if they maybe start to get a circle of ten to fifteen I believe that you start to see. I believe that's accurate. Yeah, the mom and pop. Well, I don't like really to call them mom and pop labs. I, I mean, uh, we call them STLs. As a, as a gentleman in Kentucky told me, I've known my mom and pop for 43 years, and I've never gone home and watched them cook meth. And, and I, I really believe that that's accurate. Uh, we call them STLs because that's what they are. They're very toxic labs. But there is a difference between those who are predominantly cooking for themselves in the immediate household and those who are actually dealers as well. That's right. If you, if you look at the people who are cooking in their, their houses, uh, you're looking at small labs, probably no more than an ounce. Uh, then you have the people who are cooking f to support their habit and also to make money. They're going to be the multi-ounce purchasers. They're the guys that are going to be going out and smurfing large quantities of, of retail sales pseudo. And they're going to be going to five, six, seven, ten retail distributors, purchasing their packs, bringing it home, and starting the process. Oklahoma has probably the toughest uh, law at this point, uh, and they seem to be making some progress. Do you believe that's because of the law? You know, I'm very cautious to discuss the Oklahoma law. And, and the reason is because, as you said, statistics the statistics that are coming out now, let's talk about the CLSS first of all. I think you mentioned that the CLSS, the statistics are kind of off. And the reason is, is there's always a time lag between when the, when the lab is seized, when the paperwork is submitted. Now in the CLSS, the paperwork is submitted from all different areas. On the west coast, it's submitted through WISN, which is a, uh, uh, a collaborative intelligence center. Uh, there could be a two to three month lifetime, but in these smaller departments, I mean, they have so much to do, they might not submit their paperwork for three, four, or five months. Uh, they're getting it in, they're just not getting in on a timely basis. And I understand, I was a lab agent for many years, I still am a lab agent. Uh, I don't feel that it's, it's any one, uh, it, 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 the blame should not be put on these officers, they're doing their best. But that's why we don't look at those statistics on an up-to-date we don't look at uh, the November statistics and say, look at this, this is where we are. We usually wait about four to six months from the, from the month we're looking at to make a determination, well, that's a good number. So well, what I'd like to do, and I think what the administration and the department wants to do, is sit back and wait about a year. Look at the statistics after a year to make a determination how much impact that Oklahoma legislation had. And, and I and think that's the prudent thing to do. Did you see the Oregonian has a, a cumulative chart that combines DEA data and a, a RAND study that shows when we regulated uh, ephedrine, the purity of meth dropped dramatically over a period of a number of years. Then as they figured out they could use pseudoephedrine, it went back up again. And when we started to put more regulations on pseudoephedrine, it dropped again. Um, uh, that is a long-term chart that shows some correlation to the regulation uh, that uses some DA data. Are you familiar with that uh, chart? I, I've, I've read that article numerous times, and I am familiar with that. I'm interested to see where the purity data came from. I, that, you know, I, I don't know where those sources. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with the sources that you got that data from. Obviously, whenever we we uh, have a major enforcement push, an operation that cuts the flow of precursor chemicals, there's going to be less of a market, uh, less uh, less methamphetamine on the market. If there's less methamphetamine on the market, the dealers that have the methamphetamine are going to uh, cut their product to service more people. And so you're going to see a purity decrease. Uh, that, that's an absolute. I'd appreciate it if you could, since the footnote source is DEA and a RAND study, uh, would be to get back to us with particulars, because if that study is incorrect, or uh, I know the difficulty of determining purity too, uh, a chart makes it look very scientific. But uh, that's actually good news if we show that when we combine uh, intercept internationally and control at the local pharmacy level, uh, that we have a reduction in purity, uh, but I'd like to make sure that that chart's accurate. Thank you, sir. I will take care of that.
Mr. Cummings. You don't, uh, you don't believe that the numbers are accurate when it comes to people involved in using methamphetamine, is that? Sounds like you and the chairman were in some agreement on that. <clears throat> in other words, the number of people, whether the stats that we get, and he just talked about Indiana, and then you seem like you kind of verified it, that you don't believe that the stats, he said the jails are filled with methamphetamine addicts. And I thought you kind of verified it, but tell me, I mean, what do you feel? See, I, I guess what I'm trying to get to is, first of all, we have to understand what our problem is and the extent of it before we can deal with it. And if we are not getting numbers that are accurate, and you gave some reasons why they might not be accurate, but first of all, I want to know, do you, you obviously believe that the problem is worse than what it appears to be, or the, what the information is being put out to be? Oh, absolutely. I believe there's a, there's a terrible problem with methamphetamine abuse, and I believe there's a very large population of abusers out there. I believe there's a large population of abusers that haven't been identified. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely correct. And when we look at the I listened to you uh, talk about things that the DEA was doing, and gentlemen, you might want to chime in whenever you get ready to. Um, and we're talking about training. Yes, sir. Tell me uh, just generally about the training. I mean, what does the training entail that's different than, say, dealing with other drugs? Well, there's several. There's several different training courses, but let's let's take you through the what an agent goes through for training. Uh, you start with your clandestine lab investigation and safety course. That's about two weeks long. Uh, once you get that course under your belt and you go out, uh, learn a little bit about labs, then they send you back for safety officer school, which I believe is another three to five days. Uh, that's advanced training. You get to learn about the equipment and how to take it apart, make sure how to check it, make sure it's you know, functions properly, how to set up a site safety, how to make sure that, you know, all the toxic substances are identified and removed. Then you go into your instructor class, and that's basically the progression. Uh, it's quite a bit of training, and there's also a lot of on-the-job training. When we take our lab agents into, you know, our new lab agents into the labs, it's on-the-job training. We're teaching them what to do and what not to do. I, the problem with labs, unlike other law enforcement is, until you've done it, until you've seen a process go bad, uh, you really just don't know. And, and it's, you're working in very restrictive suits. You do an entry where, you know, a lot of times your vision is restricted because you're wearing respiratory gear. Uh, you have to operate in these, in these big bulky suits. You have to be very careful. Uh, there's always an inhalation problem where, you know, you could inhale toxic substances. It's just a different type of law enforcement. It's a very different type of law enforcement. Let me ask you, let me ask you this. If you were up here and you've got people uh, in your district that are suffering tremendously with regard to meth addiction and you see the labs all over the place, I mean, what would you do? I mean, in other words, is there something that we can do that we're not doing? Because that's the bottom line. I mean, is there something that we as members of Congress can do? We obviously have bad numbers and the problem is worse than what we think it is. Clearly, this drug is destroying a whole lot of people. Um, I'm always amazed when I go into these various uh, counties outside of urban areas and find out how many people are involved in drugs and cannot, they serve their time, maybe they get caught, they can't get jobs, they can't support their families, and then they're back in jail again. Communities destroyed, families paying out money, good, hardworking people trying to keep their kids going 
trying to stop them from committing crimes. So they're coming out of their pockets with money that they could be paying their mortgages and buying food with and medicine or whatever. So it's a drain, it's a tremendous drain on our society. And I'm just trying to figure out how, I mean, what can we do to try to address this problem that's just, is this really going out of whack? I mean, what would you do? Other, more than what we are doing. Well, and, and then just one tag on question on that one. Sure. You were talking about we should wait, that the federal government should wait and see how these state laws um, work out. And I think that's not an unreasonable um, proposition. The problem is, is that there are too many people suffering in the meantime. And I'm just wondering how long is long enough? To, to wait. I'm assuming we're going to get some people coming up here saying how great their state law is working and they and I'm, I'm just guessing they may say the federal government ought to be doing this and helping out and maybe making this a, across the board so that you can help us in our communities. And then I just since you won't be coming back up, I just want to, you know, get you to answer that. Well, personally, I believe that uh, looking at the data for about a year, if we could look at a, a year's worth of data, I think that'll give the statistics an, enough time to stabilize, uh, and we could we could make a, a good determination of where what impact it's having on the community. Obviously, if the if the lab seizures dramatically significantly decrease within a year, then we should look at that legislation strongly. But what we do also see is, is peaks and valleys, and it might not stabilize down. There might be another source of that pseudoephedrine coming in somewhere. That's why we always like to wait we, to make a determination, to make an informed determination. For me to come back here and tell you, I believe that this is the way to go, I, I think it, it wouldn't be prudent for me to say at this point in time, you know, this is it, this is, this is what we've, we need. Um, is it promising? Absolutely, it's promising. But I don't think I could sit here today and tell you that that's, that's at this point in time, with what I have, the statistical data I have, that that's necessarily the answer. It is a very promising piece of legislation. I know the legislation you're talking about. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, I don't think we have enough data to make that determination. Now, now just the, to the first part of the question, what would you do? Is there something that we can do more than what we're already doing? Well, obviously, uh, there's an awareness issue, getting the retailers to, to understand that this is extremely dangerous, uh, allowing, uh, allowing people to walk into a store and buy 10, 15 packs of, of blister uh, exempt products. Uh, Obviously, if you're buying 10 to 15 packs of blister packs, uh, I don't, I, I just can't imagine you have that bad of a cold. I think that you're doing something else with the drug. And, and if retailers would understand that, they'd limit. About three years ago, when I was a section chief in the dangerous drugs and chemicals section, I sent two of my guys into a local place. Just, I said, here's $500, see how much pseudoephedrine could buy. And they basically came back with a bag full of pseudoephedrine. And there was no, you know, they paid $350 for it and no one looked at them. No one said boo. Uh, so I think part of the, the one component is the retailers have to be our partners. The retailers are going to have to stop allowing people to walk in and purchase quantities, large quantities. I think that's part of the issue. So basically, and, then, and I just want to leave you with this. I never thought I'd go all the way back to when I was 16 with regard to this issue. But when I was 16 years old, I worked in a drugstore. Yes, sir. And I remember, I didn't even understand Robitussin, but I remember people used to come and buy Robitussin. I mean like seven and eight bottles of it. Now, I knew people had colds and everything, but I thought that was a bit much, but I didn't know. Come to find out, they were buying Robitussin to get high. And when I figured it out, I mentioned it to the fellow who now is deceased who owned the drugstore. And he was saying, you got to understand, you know, uh, I've, I've got to make a profit. 
I would hope that we would be able to get the kind of cooperation from our, from, you know, the drugstores and whatever. But I'm not sure that that's enough. And, that, and I guess that's the frustrating part of all of this as I listen to all of you. And perhaps the witnesses that will come later will help us. But I can't believe that we have to sit and wait while you know all this destruction is taking place, it's, and maybe it's maybe I'm just too impatient. But I, we I, got one. But we got one life to live. This is it. I understand your frustration, sir. I've been doing this. <laughs> I've been working lab cases as a diversion investigator and agent since 1986, and I've watched the the, the progression of this problem. I've seen them go from phenyl phenyl two propanone to phenyl acetic acid to ephedrine, to pseudoephedrine, and all the weird combinations in between. It's a very frustrating process, and no one's more frustrated than me because I have to go out into the communities and talk to the local officers and hear their problems. And they are problems. They're serious problems because they care about the people they protect and serve. Uh, at, this, at this juncture, though, I mean, we've got to look at all different types of legislation. We've got to see what is going to be the most effective thing before we could sit here and make a determination. Do you think the Office of Drug Control Policy, for example, is doing enough in regard to prevention? I mean, when you hear the stories like Mr. Micah talked about, the baby being put in the microwave, we've heard all kinds of stories. If some people could just see films of things that people do on meth, I just wonder whether it would make them think twice before they even got involved in it. And then, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about the training. Um, and I want to say that the department has worked very hard to expand uh, the, the training opportunities, but there's still barriers to many law enforcement receiving the training. Um, do you have, or can you make available to the committee uh, how many um, law, I'll use my state for an example, how many uh, sheriff's offices through the counties, how many uh, municipalities have taken advantage of the training, the follow-up training that's involved in it, because what we're, what we're seeing is, yeah, people are going out and, and getting trained on it, but there's so many other demands, state cuts occurring in law enforcement and other things that we don't have maybe as many people taking advantage of the training as, as we realize. Just as um, Congressman Cummings was talking about, really knowing the numbers of people who are incarcerated, as, 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 chair, uh, as the chair pointed out, um, how many children are being impacted in social services and everything like that. We need to get a handle on, on, on this uh, for the numbers, and I don't know if you have that uh, available, if you could uh, uh, get it to the committee. Mr. Chairman and uh, Congresswoman McCollum, um, we, we certainly would be happy at the department to get you that information. I would like to follow up, though, as the training aspect and share with you just a, just a, a better snapshot of what's actually happening. Um, it's, it's imperative, as I mentioned in my testimony about the rural jurisdictions, too many times uh, sheriff's deputies will be going into a scene that they're going there for something else and they have no idea that uh, they're going to encounter a meth lab. Um, it could be a protective service order or something that they're going to serve, and they do. And if they've been improperly trained, we've already put their life at risk. So what's important for us to look at is to, and getting to, to Congressman Cummings' issue as far as what is it that we could do differently while you, in the meantime, continue to look at the legislative remedies, I think it's important for us to expand our training efforts. I mentioned to you uh, again in the testimony that we're going to triple, uh, we're doing it currently, tripling our methamphetamine training at a state level, but it's a state level in the sense of those who receive our funds, because that's our point of contact, uh, to provide it for the locals. So if you can envision that in 12 states this coming year for the first time, the Bureau of Justice Assistance will be able to offer that training to all local law enforcement through the state criminal justice entity is, is a huge step forward. 
for us to be able to, in that training, to educate law enforcement officers on a traffic stop, as an example, when they pull over someone, uh, someone's car for a speeding ticket, what have you, and approach the car and they see these chemicals in the back, many law enforcement officers have no idea what they're actually seeing. So it's imperative that we educate the law enforcement officers. Uh, as was mentioned from DEA, it's imperative we educate pharmacists and, and clerks in facilities, whether it be a, a, a retail facility or, or a drugstore chain, what to look for so that they can, in fact, alert law enforcement. Training is something that we could do more of, and that's public education as well. I think that so much of that can happen. In my own home state, uh, we, we found uh, methamphetamines, methamphetamine labs in the back of trunks at rest stops. And so it, it is, it, it's a pervasive issue, but I still think uh, there is much more that we can do through training and education. I think you, you had referenced even the context of uh, treatment, and when you're looking at facilities, uh, Mr. Chairman, you referenced in, in the county uh, facilities in your community, uh, the residential substance abuse treatment program that our agency runs, those resources to actually uh, invest those back into uh, the state and local communities so folks can receive tra treatment while they're incarcerated so we don't maintain uh, that revolving door. We can continue to make utilization of the regional information sharing systems that are out there that uh, the Department of Justice funds so that one jurisdiction, because as we know, an epidemic occurs, if it's in Fort Wayne, Indiana, it will soon be in Van Wert, Ohio. And so it's important for us to continue to educate, and the best way to do that is through law enforcement information sharing systems, such as, in this case, the risk network that is funded uh, by the government and, and administered through our office. So uh, again, we can get you more specific details on who has been trained, uh, what's available. I can tell you the LLABG resources and the burn resources are heavily involved in training initiatives for law enforcement, as well as funding uh, the majority of the law enforcement multi-jurisdictional drug task forces that are out in the country. And, and, and that's good, and I support the dollars for doing that, but we're, you know, sometimes I have found that other law enforcement issues aren't funded in order to increase funding into another program, and, and we need to be uh, cognizant of not turning our back on, a, on another potential uh, uh, source of crime. Um, to, to, to fund a, another one. Uh, I, I'll use Minnesota as the example. 10% um, of the methamphetamine, um, to the best of our knowledge, is from the small labs. 90% is what's coming in. Now, of that 10%, we need to address it aggressively. We need to continue to work with our retailers and, and that. But to just focus uh, overwhelmingly for, and each state's going to be different, um, for, for that 10% that when 90% of it is what's coming in, and we're seeing an increase on that, what do we need to do to stop that 90% coming in over the borders? I mean, we are supposed to be at heightened alert for activity now that is with Homeland Security, with what's going on with, with our borders, and when we see 90% of it, not being produced locally, but coming in. Um, and the, the, the term Mex uh, from Mexico was used by my law enforcement. I think we still have a, a huge problem going back to Homeland Security. So where's the integration going on with that? What do we need to be aware of in, in Congress to make that more effective? Because if we can't keep out methamphetamine, um, uh, how are we keeping out uh, terrorists? Well, ma'am, uh, to start, uh, I don't think we're concentrating just on the small labs. I think the small labs are, are important because the meth coming from Mexico uh, or other countries, uh, it's produced and it's, it's in the marketplace. When, when, when these uh, people actually make methamphetamine and STLs, it, it, create, it presents a, a grave problem for the health and safety of the community at large. Sir, and, and that's sir I understand that fully, and, I, and, I, and that's why I prefaced it. I don't take away the seriousness of the 10%. I have law enforcement officers who've had to retire early because of going into meth labs and literally having their lungs destroyed. I take this very seriously. I had a constituent who purchased a home who ran a daycare in it, and it wasn't disclosed in their retail. I understand that. 
I support the actions that the committee's taking on this. We need to focus on it. But in Minnesota, when 90 percent of the methamphetamine is coming in, my, the prisons are full, there's no treatment facility. We have children who are now in our social, our social network system and that. I also want to know what we are doing as a country to decrease the amount of methamphetamine that's coming in illegally into this country. Well, to begin with, we're working with our foreign counterparts at the chemical producing countries. Uh, we're, we're trying to track that chemical shipments from places like China and Germany and India into those chemical producing countries. We're trying to stop the, actually asking for a voluntary uh, stop of those shipments. Uh, we're notified of the shipments. We know where they're going and we know where the methamphetamine is being produced. Say in Mexico, for instance, we know that Mexico has got several production laboratories down there. We're working with the Mexican authorities. We're actually training the Mexican authorities in clandestine laboratory enforcement so they could go out, find and identify these labs and dismantle them. Uh, unfortunately, when the problem moves outside of domestic uh, the domestic boundaries, we, you know, we have to work in conjunction with our international partners, and we're doing that. We're doing that uh, in Mexico and abroad. Uh, it's difficult to shut down the border for methamphetamine, just as it is for cocaine and heroin, because the trafficking groups generally don't send one huge load through one particular. Uh, port of entry, what they do is they find very novel approaches to move uh, contraband into the country. Uh, if, if I produce 300 pounds of methamphetamine, I'm not going to move them all through one port of entry. What I'm going to do is split the load. That way, if I lose two, two components of the load, I still have two to make my profit. And that's what's happening. Uh, but we still do have super labs here as well. Uh, not to the extent that we had two years ago but we still have production labs here. So we're working the production labs domestically uh, on an enforcement basis with DEA and our counterparts, our, our local state counterparts, and then we're working abroad in the, in the chemical producing countries uh, where the precursors start, and then in the production countries such as Mexico where it's being manufactured. Mr. Chair, I think that because they are two very serious ways in which people access these Ill illegal drugs, both, both the, the, the small labs here and, and, as the gentleman pointed out, there are some large labs here, but also the international um, trafficking of this over our borders at a time when we believe in Congress that we're spending a lot of money trying to make our borders more secure. Um, both, both of those maybe need to be uh, separated out, as well as this is such a big topic. Maybe what we need to do, uh, Mr. Chair, with your help, is to, is to break this, break this hearing, break the next set of hearings down in, into smaller components, so we can really wrestle and, and, and get into what we need to do congressionally to uh, put an end to this this, this problem. I appreciate your suggestion, and uh, as we pursue the meth problem, that's a, a good point. I, I want uh, you to know, as, as well as our, uh, uh, the other members of the panel and those who are listening, that we are having a uh, uh, major internal battle, which I think, uh, based on an everyday changes that we've made some progress on, Speaker Hastert's been taking the lead. Obviously, border control and homeland security uh, the narcotics part and homeland security are totally interrelated. They're the same people on the border. And one of the uh, arguments we're having on the so-called 9-11 Commission bill uh, is a series of amendments that uh, I had in the Homeland Security Committee that the Speaker is advocating to strengthen the Air and Marine Division uh, inside border protection, which is in danger of being gutted, uh, that uh, to strengthen the counter narcotics office, it didn't even have anything but a detailee there, even though Coast Guard, Border Patrol, Customs, those legacy agencies are the major part, uh, to also uh, take a number of other steps. We've seen the Shadow Wolves, in effect, disbanded. 
which is a critical part on the Arizona border, and we cannot talk about how we're going to control the borders if we disband the anti-narcotics operations inside Homeland Security. The Department of Homeland Security has to understand that the narcotics is, if they're in charge of the border, narcotics is part of their mission. And that this committee has been taking the lead, and we need to continue to push that uh, part of it. Uh, in, in addition, uh, clearly, if we lose these court rulings on the drug dogs, this is a disaster at the borders. Uh, there has been a, a, I think it's a local hearing that's going up towards the federal level that would challenge the propriety of a, a drug dog hits at the border. Uh, and that is one of the only ways that we uh, pick up the random if we don't have a tip. And th that if we don't have control of the border, anything else we talk about becomes more or less irrelevant. I need to ask a series of questions here, which we may not have all the answers, but I want to make sure some of these get in the record and we'll have some additional, because we are working towards a package and also what we should focus on on hearings in this uh, next year. Uh, and I want to follow up directly with one of the things that Ms. McCollum just asked, Mr. Anasisi. Uh, the Oregonian newspaper uh, reported uh, that uh, DEA has not actively sought information or cooperation from manufacturers or law enforcement authorities in India, one of the major pseudo-federal pseudo exporters. The Indians, however, claim that they are very willing to work with DEA to address the diversion program, in, uh, including by providing DEA with documentation about exports to third countries, such as Canada. Does DEA plan to increase its efforts in India and elsewhere to monitor and track the pseudo-federal exports to third countries? We do work with the Indian government. Uh, we sit on numerous international committees uh, where there is dialogue between uh, our staff and the Indian government regarding sales of or shipments of chemicals. I, I don't understand where that came from, but that, that's could, just not the case. Okay, could you provide us with uh, how many uh, agents in uh, India that you have working on, on this? Uh, roughly, I realize agents do multiple uh, tasks and also, in particular, the question of third countries. In other words, often we're looking directly to us, but a lot of this is coming from Mexico and, and, and uh, Canada. Also, uh, do you and Mr. Burns, do you believe we need new import uh, quotas or controls uh, to prevent diversion of pseudofedrin? I, I didn't get the question. Do, do you I believe, believe we need new import yes. quotas or other controls to prevent diversion of pseudoephedrine? Yes, I think that was something that would be very helpful and uh, uh, to address some of the questions that you've asked and, and Congresswoman McCollum and Ranking Member Cummings. Uh, let, me, let me just try and briefly state this. You have been very helpful. Uh, ranking Member, you asked, we need to step back and look at the overall picture. And at the Office of National Drug Control Policy, that's what we try and do, and rely on good numbers for sound policy. Uh, you require it. The President requires it. Drug Czar John Walters certainly requires it. And what we know uh, from the household survey and from monitoring the future is that there are currently 19.5 million illegal drug users in this country. Some of the most recent numbers. 75 percent singularly are co use marijuana, about 6 million are using illegally prescription drugs. It's a 150 percent increase in five years. That's a problem. About 3 million uh, cocaine, about 1.5 heroin, and about 1.5 methamphetamine. So why this hearing today and why the federal government's response uh, so uh, aggressively to methamphetamine? For all the reasons that you have stated. Uh, we could be here all day uh, and I could try and respond to you what we have been doing in the state of Minnesota. I have been there three times in the last year. Uh, I flew with your senator to small towns all over the state. We had uh, uh, hearings, I called them talk, listen sessions. Uh, senator Rosen has been very aggressive in, in gaining the ear of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, with your governor, I recently flew around to several small towns and we listened again, uh, trying to fix problems one at a time with respect to training literally getting on the phone with law enforcement agencies, hooking them up with the Midwest Haida, which is located close by, and demanding that treatment inf uh, training information and access be made available. Uh, Ranking Member Cummings, you have one of the best Haidas in the country. Uh, Director Tom Carr, and I know that you have been wholly and fully engaged with Director Walters and others, not only on this problem, uh, but others. But the one point that I would uh, like to make, and Mr. Ranazizi, uh, has talked about uh, the 
the uh, need to look at the numbers, it is because you, you demand good policy. This National Synthetics Drug Action Plan came out less than a month ago. It has taken us a long time uh, to define what the issues are with all synthetic drugs and to come up with a plan so at some point we can come to you uh, with numbers and with uh, recommendations uh, that are appropriate. And uh, I am going to chair a synthetic drug working group. The plan requires that that be set up within 30 days, and the first meeting will take place within the next couple of weeks. And then I hope, uh, and I say this to all of you, that we will be able to come back, as Mr. Renizzisi has said, with good numbers so that you can make good decision based on sound policy. Um, I, want to, I want to pursue, uh, because uh, we need to get to our, our second panel, uh, but I have some very specifics that I want to have the record. Did DEA support new import quotas and controls to prevent diversion? I'm sorry, sir. Could Do you, you support that new import quotas or other controls to prevent diversion of pseudoephedrine? I, I believe that is in the National Drug Synthetic Action Plan, and I do believe we support that, absolutely. Um, the, um, uh, another uh, 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 question has to do uh, with uh, Glotel. Uh, there have been lots of news stories around the country that says when Glotel uh, is added to anhydrous ammonia, it dyes it bright pink. Apparently the bright pink color transfers to any meth made with anhydrous ammonia and actually stains any users of the drug. Should the government promote the, promote the use of this additive? I, I, I know about the additive. I just don't know enough to promote or, you know, tell you that that's, it's a good program. I do know that there's a couple of other studies out there, including uh, University are, are of Are you investigating this, or is ONDCP I, I, or Justice? I believe our, our, uh, our lab program is investigating it. Our forensic laboratory program is looking okay, into can it. Can you uh, have somebody respond to the committee on the, any investigations on Glotel? Yes. Also, the Oregonian newspaper said Pfizer has announced it would soon introduce a new form of pseudofed, which contains instead of pseudofedrin a compound called penny phenylephrine. And you earlier just referred to some acid that sounded like it was the same basic component. You said phenytric acid. Phenylacetic acid. It's so a different. It's different. a different okay. precursor. It was so one of the primary precursors used way back. So, it would do you believe that uh, that? Uh, that such chemicals like that could uh, uh, prevent meth use, or will they be able to transfer like they've transferred from ephedrine to pseudoephedrine? If we're talking about the, the drug phenylephrine, our lab has done studies with phenylephrine, and they do not believe that you could manufacture methamphetamine from that substance. So that becomes a, uh, that's a very interesting question, because there may be more than one way to tackle this uh, problem. I also, uh, we have some other written questions I want to submit, but I want to uh, say both to uh, the Department of Justice and the SeaTac program that what, we're, what we've heard in state after state from law enforcement officials um, is they appreciate the training. Their number one problem right now is not the training. They don't have cleanup uh, equipment. In SeaTac or from Bureau of Justice Assistance, uh, these mobile labs are very expensive. Uh, what's happening is we're freelancing in the appropriations process. Uh, I, for two straight years, have gotten money for Indiana that way. Tennessee has, has gotten money for their state. Uh, Hawaii's gotten money for their state. What's happening, because the, bluntly put, the administration is not responding, in my opinion, to what local law enforcement is asking, individual members of Congress are freelancing and, and uh, earmarking your appropriations. Um, and we need to look at and, and listen at the grassroots level. Otherwise, we're going to have chaos in our appropriations process with no national drug control plan. We're going to have individual members of Congress responding to what they're hearing from the grassroots level. And that, that's one thing that we need to look at in the mix of, of the equipment and how to do that. Uh, does anybody else have anything on the first? I have two questions. Just two questions. And I'll, I'll submit some written questions, gentlemen. I want to thank you for your testimony. Mr. Rez. I'll <clears throat> tell you, um, does, does meth uh, addicts present a, any unique uh, problems with regard to treatment, being amenable to treatment? You know? Methamphetamine? Does it? Do addicts. In other words, I'm thinking about treatment. I was just listening to what the chairman was saying, different ways to try to approach this whole issue. Do they present any unique 
problems with regard to being amenable to treatment? Do you, do you, if, if, if you know, you may not even know. M Mr. Chairman, Congressman Cummings, yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Meth is highly addictive. And mm -hmm. so if, if you look at, and those statistics are available, if you look at uh, from CSAP and others, SAMHSA, you'll find uh, statistics that will show that. That's, that's a correct assumption. So which are, I, the reason why I mention it is because I'm trying to figure out, you know, the drug courts and all the things we're trying. I'm just wondering if we need to look at that and maybe some of the folk coming up with can, uh, will mention something about that. But I'm just trying to figure out whether if they are more difficult to treat, because I've been a big proponent of treatment, um, just want to make sure that we're doing what we, we need to be doing in that area. And I'm sure somebody will address it. Congressman, if it's helpful, uh, your appropriation to the President's Access to Recovery Program uh, grant was made to the state of Tennessee. Uh, and pursuant to that grant, they are uh, in the process of answering the question that you uh, just asked. Uh, currently, everything is anecdotally, as I travel the country, programs from seven days to uh, a year and a half. Thank you all very much. Mr. Chair, to follow up on that, maybe we can, uh, as we break, uh, if if you have the the time to to break this this down and out a little more, have someone in from CDC and uh, NIH, and I just uh, handed Mr. Cummings uh, two articles. They do not feel that any of the treatment programs that are currently out there are successful at all in really addressing hardcore addiction on this. And so what we're doing is we're just um, recycling them through the prison population, they come back, more crimes are committed, and it's a, it's a never-ending cycle. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, we're, uh, law enforcement is starting to see, literally, in families, three generations of, of abuse on this. So uh, treatment and, and, and that does become a key thing we need to talk about. Thank you. And we'll, uh, we have been uh, the only state that has a 10-year tracking on this uh, uh, Congressman Case asked us to do a hearing in Hawaii because they got the biggest uh, earmark. I think it was five million dollars for meth uh, in the appropriations process through Senator uh, Akaka, I believe, or in a way. Uh, and they have had they have actual data of, of different types of patterns in meth at the schools over a 10-year tracking. Uh, they have it uh, in treatment programs as well, and they have. One, but we're trying to find even programs that are geared specifically towards meth treatment are hard to find. So it's been hard at this point even to get a hearing cluster enough together to treat it, but that would be one of our goals for this coming year and appreciate your help with that. And it's a good idea to get CDC and some of the other groups in. Uh, I very much appreciate your patience. We'll have additional uh, uh, written questions for you and thank you for your continued work in this field. We have made progress and we shouldn't uh, D deny that, and marijuana has been a fairly dramatic, which is a precursor drug for all meth users. Uh, we have made progress, and hopefully that will pay off over time. But short term, we have an exploding problem uh, across the country that's growing faster than our even our statistical ability to keep up with it in meth, and we need to respond to that, and we appreciate your willingness to come today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, could the second panel uh, come forward? Mr. Lonnie Wright, uh, Sheriff Bundy, uh, Lieutenant Colby, Mr. Herons, Dr. Sudam, and Ms. Wagner. Sudam. Could each of you uh, stand and raise your right hand? Do you swear that the testimony you give today is the truth, all truth, and nothing but the truth, self-guide? 
Let the record show that each of the witnesses responded in the affirmative. We've been uh, joined by our distinguished co uh, colleague from the state of uh, Kansas, who has been very concerned with this issue for a long period of time, Mr. Moran, and uh, he has uh, would like to personally introduce one of the witnesses, and we'll uh, start with that witness today. Mr. Chairman uh, and Mr. Cummings, thank you very much for the honor of joining you on the dais today, and I'm here uh, to commend you for your subcommittee's work. Uh, I know as a member of Congress from a, from a very rural district uh, that this is a significant issue for my constituents, for my state, uh, and in fact I have fought uh, long to bring to the attention of the administration as well as members of Congress that I think challenges we face with drugs in this country are often thought of to be an urban problem, uh, woefully not true and particularly not true with methamphetamines. Uh, and so I'm honored to be here today uh, to join you and to particularly introduce uh, one of the witnesses on this panel. Uh, this issue received significant attention in Kansas in 1994. We had four meth bus. Uh, in 2004, we'll have between five and 600. Uh, we've had, uh, when our former colleague, Mr. Hutchinson, was at uh, DEA, he's been to Kansas to meet with uh, law enforcement. I had the Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime come to Kansas and conduct a hearing on rural issues related to methamphetamines. And you have before you today one of our experts, uh, our sheriff from Rice County, Kansas, uh, Sheriff Bundy. Uh, the sheriff is highly regarded in law enforcement circles in Kansas, have been actively involved in law enforcement for more than two decades. Uh, and he comes from a county that um, in some ways is many more, is, has a larger population uh, than many of my other counties, with I would guess a population around 10,000 people in the entire county. Uh, this is one of my urban sheriffs, and uh, we're delighted to have his perspective, and I welcome him and thank him for taking the time uh, in his uh, dedication to the cause to be here today, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Cummings, for allowing me to join you. Thank you. Sheriff, you have the floor. Uh, yeah, hit the button there. Moran and uh, Chairman Souter. Ranking Member Cummings and other distinguished members, I'm very happy to be here today and hopefully provide some insight and some tough decisions you have to make in the near future. Um, as Congressman Moran stated, I've been in law enforcement for about two decades in Kansas. I am a certified meth lab investigator. As a matter of fact, Tuesday I was at a meth lab for nine hours right before flying out here to be with you. Um, so I think I might be able to offer you some insights that, that may be helpful. Um, we are a very rural county. We have a population of about 10,000. We, uh, we're 750 square miles. There's myself and four officers to uh, provide service for those 10,500 people, which is representative of about 75% of Kansas law enforcement. And I think if we look at it even beyond the boundaries of Kansas, that's not so non-typical for Western United States um, once you leave this fine area. Um, we do have a serious methamphetamine problem. One of the reasons is the very qualities we enjoy is our agricultural nature, the wide open spaces, the things that are most appealing to those involved in producing methamphetamine um, draws them to our, our county. We don't have the resources to do a lot with that given the five people, so we came up with a program that uh, is called Meth Watch in Kansas. I'm going to br briefly tell you how that works for us. And, and it simply was a recognition and an admission by myself that my resources uh, were overwhelmed with the problem. We went to the community and said, we need your help. We educated the citizens on the very prod problem with methamphetamine for our area. And once we had got them to partner with us and to see how large of a problem this was, the very scope of it, how it affected them and their taxes and overwhelmed the resources of law enforcement that we weren't responding to them in the timely manner they wished. They were very eager to partner with us in this battle against methamphetamine. Uh, the next group we brought into that were the retailers. And uh, the interesting insight to that was that they actually were calling me asking what can we do because we had such tremendous support from the community as well as through the local media on really detailing, covering all the problems that we were encountering and just the, the frequency and the amount of work we were having to, uh, to put into methamphetamine investigations. So the retailers came on board very easily and anxiously and wanted to partner with us. And the community has an expectation of those retailers to partner with them and law enforcement in this very program. 
Um, we make cases through that with great regularity. If it's not just the retailers reporting suspicious transactions or uh, odd purchases, or they they recognize just the very ingredients you have talked about today in the shopping carts coming through the lines, if they aren't calling, we're getting calls from the citizens of Kansas um, that have been trained. And when they're in line, they notice these shopping carts behind them, or they'll notice the peculiar behavior of uh, a multitude of individuals coming in and splitting up and buying these purchases and then lining up uh, in the checkout line. So it's been very effective for us in Kansas to approach it at the community level um, through a very strong education piece that was only possible by a small grant through the Kansas Methamphetamine Project um, of $3,000 is really what initiated this Meth Watch program. So I don't want you to, to uh, underestimate the value, I think, of the federal dollars coming down to state levels and from the state level to the local level and what $3,000 can do because it's had a huge impact uh, in my county. Um, briefly, Schedule 5, my neighbors to the south, the great state of Oklahoma, have introduced Schedule 5, and I, I know the early data says that's working well for them. I know there are some border counties in Kansas that are reporting an influx of Oklahoma residents coming up to purchase that, and I hope it works. I, I am a little guarded, as you've heard earlier. Um, on that, because in my experience in 20 years, it's very hard to regulate or legislate addiction. And uh, relocating products, uh, limiting products, it is still a very hard thing to take away from these people because I work with them every day. Truly, a portion of every work day is dedicated to methamphetamine work in a county my size, which hinders the civil process and the jail operation and, and all the other services that that the sheriff's office is forced to, uh, to provide. So any tool we can come up with that helps is great. Um, the grants were great, not only on the education front for the Meth Watch, but also in my training. Um, I'm the only meth investigator for clandestine labs in our county, which puts me at safety risk as well as the citizens only be able to provide one officer for that service. And unfortunately, there has not been funding available in our state to train any more of my officers so I can't partner up with another officer in these dangerous situations. So I'd encourage you to expand the grant portion of uh, your investigation here because it is critical to local law enforcement. Um, you asked earlier about Glowtail. I very much support that. We take an anhydrous ammonia theft daily. Um, we, we recover anhydrous ammonia in any kind of container imaginable. So anything you can do to help the rural America on that front would be greatly appreciated too. Um, in summary, it is just truly all my life has become as an officer. When I started in 1979, it was more often I was in a uniform like this. Now, more often than not, I look like a spaceman working for NASA in a suit with breathing apparatus and, and testing equipment and things like that. So I would encourage you to listen carefully today and uh, be very open-minded and, and come up with a comprehensive approach that would assist rural law enforcement. And I'll be happy to answer your questions at the conclusion. Thank you. And as I've uh, earlier stated, all your written statements will be submitted to of any, any uh, uh, witness. And I want to depart from our normal procedure just a little because we have not in a Washington hearing uh, had anybody uh, in detail explain who does it here? We've done it in the field hearings. We hear it all the time. You said it took you nine hours. Why did it take you nine hours? Because it was a small lab, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> there have been labs that I've been at for 30, 32, 35 hours without a break, without stopping. Uh, it's just the complexity of the process, the hazards that are left behind that need remediated correctly. Um, the collecting of evidence, most of these scenes have hundreds of pieces of evidence that have to be photographed and documented and collected. Um, there's disposal orders that have to be sought from the judicial system to allow us to get rid of some evidence that's just too hazardous to store for trial. Um, it, it's just a very large undertaking and that's just even further 
complicated by the rural nature of Kansas in that oftentimes these sites are 15, 20, 40 miles from other resources. So when you do get a contracted company to help with the final disposal of the identified hazards, it, it just pretty much eats into an entire day. Well, I thank you for that because we have heard testimony across the country um, <clears throat> and that particularly in small, of which 10,000 up to 80,000 counties, uh, four to nine hours. Uh, Mr. Wright told me out in the hall earlier, 12 hours in Oklahoma has, has been as long. It, you can go out there, your entire drug task force is tied up. In some counties, your entire police force is tied up <clears throat> all day long. It means nothing else is protected while you're out there dealing with one tiny lab. And that we clearly have to have some uh, way to kind of look at this problem in a macro way as well as in the micro way. Uh, now, I'd like to recognize Mr. Lonnie Wright, who's director of the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs. Thank you, Chairman Souter, uh, Ranking Member Cummings, and the rest of the distinguished members here. Uh, I'm probably the only guy that will be able to give you good news today. Uh, in Oklahoma, we've regulated pseudoephedrine, and methamphetamine labs have, have dropped off dramatically. But before I talk about that in the law, I'd like to tell you why we take, took such a, a step as regulating pseudoephedrine and making it a controlled substance. Like many other states, in, in our region anyway, uh, beginning in 1994, we've seen a steady increase in methamphetamine laboratories. Uh, I think the last few years we've worked over 1,200 laboratories, and I know you've discussed reporting. In my opinion, these numbers are grossly underreported. I can tell you that in many cases when uh, deputies in rural areas uh, encounter boxed labs and, and, and trash that's often dumped by people who manufacture every few days, uh, they don't wait 19 hours or 12 hours or whatever. Uh, they simply dump it in the trash. So those kind of statistics typically aren't reported. Uh, we don't see super labs in Oklahoma. We, we haven't since uh, uh, the late 80s. All we see are addict-operated laboratories. Uh, these laboratories are uh, uh, operated by people who uh, are simply supplying their own addiction and, and that of a few of their close friends. Uh, this is an addiction-based crime that we're encountering, not an economic-based crime like in years past. These are not laboratories with giant flasks that look like a chemistry department at a, at a university like we've seen in the past. Uh, these are a, fruit, a few fruit jars, uh, some coffee filters, and some household products. And at the onset of this epidemic, I think a lot of times law enforcement stumbled across these products and didn't really know that they were in a meth lab. Sometimes it's, it's uh, difficult for the untrained person to tell. Uh, in Oklahoma, we spent countless millions of dollars. We've done all the traditional things that we thought were necessary to treat the symptoms of this problem. But yet every year, as you can see from my graph, those numbers just go up and up and up and seem to have no end in sight. Uh, our jails are full of methamphetamine addicts. Our treatment beds are full. Uh, our resources are strained to the hilt. Uh, we were pretty desperate and, and simply didn't know what to do. We initially had a 20 to life sentence for manufacturing methamphetamine. We had to reduce that in part to accommodate the vast numbers of people that we were uh, apprehending in, in methamphetamine laboratories. Uh, one thing that I think is, is very important to note here, and it made a difference when we had these sort of hearings in Oklahoma for understanding purposes, you don't mix a number of household products together and get methamphetamine. You start with pseudoephedrine that is molecularly very similar to, to methamphetamine. In fact, it's one uh, OH molecule different than methamphetamine, and you use those household products to burn that uh, OH molecule off uh, in just a few short hours with uh, this household apparatus uh, and, and, and these products. Uh, in reality, a methamphetamine addict looks at these cold medications on the shelf uh, like it's methamphetamine, not like we look at it as, as, as medicine. So uh, that is the single key uh, issue to focus on if you want to solve the problem. You have to keep 
pseudoephedrine out of those who would simply convert out of the hands of those who would simply convert it in a few hours. Uh, one of the differences, I think, between super laboratories and, and, and addicts who buy methamphetamine from distribution networks and those who manufacture their own is those who purchase it from uh, distribution networks have to come up with the money, and they're limited somewhat in, in their addiction and their ability to, to get as much uh, methamphetamine as you want. When you can manufacture methamphetamine in your home for a fraction of the cost, of what it would cost to buy it on the street, and you could have all of it you want, and it's basically pure, there's nothing to limit your addiction. So what we see is these people are able to make as much as they want. Uh, their addiction uh, becomes chronic very quickly. This is a terribly addictive drug, as, as you well know. Uh, prolonged chronic addiction leads to something that uh, we've been told is, is called a methamphetamine psychosis. Uh, a person who has methamphetamine psychosis is clinically indistinguishable from a paranoid schizophrenic, we're told by our medical uh, experts in Oklahoma. They're, of course, unpredictable, and uh, violent behavior is, is often a result of that unpredictability. In that sense, in the past few years in Oklahoma, with uh, this epidemic reaching uh, you know, a, a, a terrible state, um, the violence and the carnage associated with methamphetamine manufacturing and addiction has really resulted in a public safety problem uh, and an issue. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons that we focus on that in, in state and local law enforcement more than maybe Mexican drug cartels and the likes because it is such a public safety issue. Uh, about a year ago, we had an interim study in our legislature, much as uh, you're holding here, and we brought in experts from all of the various disciplines to try to understand this. One thing was clear, what we were doing simply wasn't working. Uh, we basically, in essence, concluded that as long as methamphetamine addicts have access to pseudoephedrine, there won't be any diminution in methamphetamine labs, the, the mom and pop type labs that we're talking about. Our challenge quickly became, how do you keep pseudoephedrine out of the hands of those who would turn it into methamphetamine in a few short hours while uh, not restricting access to those who have nasal congestion? Pseudoephedrine's a nasal congestion medicine. Uh, we come up with the only solution we could, uh, and that was to regulate it. Uh, what we did in Oklahoma, to, to make a long story short, uh, re we regulated all pseudoephedrine as a Schedule V controlled dangerous substance. Uh, we moved those starch-based tablets and hard gel caps behind the counter at the pharmacy. Those are the products that we see in methamphetamine laboratories. Uh, we require customers to show a photo identification and to sign a logbook. Uh, we limit sales to nine grams of pseudoephedrine per running 30-day period. We ask individual pharmacists to look at that logbook and not sell individuals more than that nine grams. And we are presently uh, pursuant to a COPS grant that we're very grateful for, developing an online, statewide, uh, real-time a logbook that would enable pharmacists uh, to access that data and know whether or not that person had purchased more than the nine grams in that 30-day period, thus having the ability to, to limit that and not let people have more pseudoephedrine than is necessary. Uh, we made exceptions. Uh, we exempted products that that we have not seen in methamphetamine laboratories that contain pseudoephedrine. Those products are the squishy, liquid-filled gel caps. We haven't encountered that, and, and all of the syrups. In, in total, the products that we moved behind the counter, uh, say at a typical Walgreens uh, store, would be about 100 products, including their uh, Equate brands. So this was really a quite doable deal. Um, we, our legislature passed uh, this idea in April 7th of this year. Uh, the only opposition we had after a great statewide debate was the industry, uh, and, and they opposed it. Uh, the citizens of the state of Oklahoma were pretty much tired of methamphetamine and problems associated with it, and uh, I believe supported it. I've heard very few complaints from anyone, and we think that it's, it's, it's quite reasonable to have a minor inconvenience to treat nasal congestion compared to uh, 
the carnage that's associated with uh, continued uh, methamphetamine addiction. Uh, as you'll note, and, and, and others here uh, agree, these are preliminary uh, uh, numbers that we're seeing, but uh, just instantaneously, the number of laboratories, methamphetamine laboratories, submitted to our state's crime laboratories dropped off by about 50%. Uh, and have steadily continued to drop in, in, in the months uh, uh, following. For example, our 27 drug task forces that are burn funded and very important, by the way, around the state do the lion's share of uh, methamphetamine laboratory investigations. Uh, in 2003, they averaged 92.4 meth labs per month. Uh, they're presently, uh, as of August, uh, that reported 32 meth labs. That's about a 65% reduction. Uh, the same sort of reductions have been seen in, in our metropolitan areas. The Oklahoma City Police Department numbers uh, have dropped off from an average of 14.5 uh, per month to, I think, September they worked two meth labs. I think in October they worked four meth labs, uh, and, and so on. So. Uh, it, we're real encouraged by this. The bottom line is if these addicts can't have uh, access to unlimited supplies of pseudoephedrine, they can't manufacture methamphetamine. You cannot manufacture that without having pseudoephedrine. The key to what you're trying to accomplish here is how do you keep that out of their hands? Uh, uh, if I could say, there's a lot of anecdotal information. You, you, need to, you need to conclude. We've given you generous time here, if you can. Sir? Make a concluding statement, because yeah. we have a five-minute clock, and I've let you about double that, but if you could conclude. Okay. I'm, I'm basically finished, and I apologize, sir. We're looking at where pseudoephedrine presently comes from. Obviously, it's coming from uh, adjacent states and areas close to the border. We see people going from pharmacy to pharmacy, signing the log, and that's called smurfing. We hope to close that gap. And we have a few uh, pharmacies that are yet to become uh, compliant. So uh, we're real excited about our results. And we, all these federal programs you've talked about here, particularly Burn and COPS, are, are very valuable to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. And I wanted to make sure you had a, f a full description of the program in because we probably had five uh, hearings in the country now and description. And almost everywhere we go, Oklahoma's program comes up. So we needed to have a, a full and thorough uh, explanation of the Oklahoma program. Uh, and we're going to have a number of, of uh, uh, witnesses here who have uh, concerns about how we do this at a federal level. And so I think that helped lay the groundwork for it. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Colby uh, is from my hometown of Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is a city larger than most areas that are uh, affected by meth, as, as he states in his written uh, testimony. But he has been the chief uh, narcotics person in, in our region for many years, and not only has the city of Fort Wayne, but coordinates the drug task force that goes beyond the city. You've been through crack, you've been through all different types of uh, uh, narcotic challenges in Fort Wayne, including just a few years ago we had this boost up in LSD and, and things come and go. This one uh, appears to be different. Uh, you've talked to me before about the importance of the burn gants, about risks uh, in the information network. And I just wondered if you could share some of your thoughts about what's happening in Indiana and some of the historical perspective with what we're looking at here. If you can hit your, uh, hit, uh, Lieutenant, if you hit your button. Uh, Congressman, and thank you very much, Chairman Sauter, for asking me to share my views of state and local meth enforcement today. I commend you on drawing attention to the meth enforcement challenge by holding this hearing. We are in the midst of a crisis. Last year in Indiana, law enforcement seized 1,260 clandestine meth labs. A total in 2004 will almost certainly be larger. In fact, just last Friday, the Indiana State Police reported to me the state, the state police alone has responded to 973 labs so far this year. I can tell you that this problem at the moment affects rural America, rural areas, excuse me, more than it does affect our larger jurisdictions. The sky high cost of taking down and dismantling meth labs is being carried by agencies with relatively very small budgets. We have learned to be very efficient at what we do, but we know we can do better if we had some more resources. To do better, we need your help. Alongside the devastating physical impact of meth on, on abusers and the saddest aspect of the meth problem is the so-called drug-endangered chil children issue. 
Investigators in Indiana often encounter children in clan lab sites. We have removed these children from immediate danger and take them to local child protective agency services to make sure that these children are tested for the presence of meth and any other toxic chemicals in their bodies. Parents who subject their children or kids to these toxic waste sites are being held accountable by the use of child endangerment laws. More than other legal, illegal drugs, meth enforcement requires a high degree of training and specialization for the officers who deal with it. Many of our officers have received specialized training and equipment provided by federal agencies such as DEA. In training, this enables us more effectively seize and dismantle clan labs. We especially appreciate the training on how to operate in labs, taking control of the sites and halting production. Let me give you an idea of the cost that we have been bearing is dealing with this problem. Specialized vehicles and equipment are very necessary to protect officers responding to hazardous sites at very and are very expensive. Appropriate training absolutely is essential, but at this time is consuming and expensive. Waiting for qualified cleanup, cleanup companies to arrive on the scene of an active lab takes two to four hours, during which officers who are on the payroll clock have to guard the site. They are in the use of, of parting, almost all of use of a shift responding to just one meth lab. And the real impact is on the bottom line. Hazardous material must be disposed of under strict government regulations. Faced with the nature of the meth problem, we cannot afford to just stand by. We have no choice but to attack the Klan labs, but the cost is enormous. We are left with little choice but to appeal with our state leaders and you here in Washington to give us a hand. Narcotic officers throughout the state of Indiana responding efforts are supporting efforts in our state legislature to pass bills that would require Indiana retailers to demand photo identification and signature in a register book in order to purchase over-the-counter products containing ephedrine and pseudoephedrine. I can tell you that we are closely watching the efforts of the state of Oklahoma, and we are aware that meth lab seizures are down about 50 percent from a year ago, and we think that something can be learned from this lesson. I believe that is based on the experience from states moving ahead with proposals that place common sense restrictions on how certain products are sold, stored, and displayed can cause a significant upset in clan lab meth production. I think you should consider a federal law that addresses these issues. You just might cause a real disruption in meth production in a small town mom and pop lab that are plaguing rural America. As a drug task force commander in Indiana, I can tell you that funding that comes from the Edward Burns Memorial fund grants program is critical in helping us tackle the meth problem. I know there are proposals to change the meth, the burns programs, but I want you to strongly urge you, Mr. Chairman, to fight to preserve the focus on burn on drug enforcement efforts. Task force operations that burn funds are absolutely essential and effective pieces of overall illegal drug enforcement strategies. As echoed by the National Narcotics Officers Association's coalitions and the Indiana Drug Enforcement Association's burn formula grants must continue and the focus must remain on drug enforcement activities. Providing the means for police officers across the United States to work in multi-jurisdictional drug task forces has created thousands of drug-related intelligence leads, gang-related intelligence, and huge numbers of arrests. Neighborhoods are safer because of these efforts. In Indiana alone, we have 34 drug task forces funded by burn and a task force of over 200 full-time narcotics officers. State and local enforcement spends billions every year in drug enforcement, but the funding provided by Byrne is the magnet that attracts different agencies to give them incentives to cooperate. In the meth investigation, we found that important methamphetamine for, for super labs support, I'm sorry, support for methamphetamines for super lab located outside the United States is a major problem. As local law enforcement, we fully support the federal anti-drug trafficking efforts of the Southwest border. We also understand that California is a very significant source of meth production in huge super labs. Because of a lot of the meth that makes its way to Indiana, we support these efforts to halt major production and trafficking activities. Effective methamphetamine enforcement means a strong support for training and equipment, but it also means reinforcing task force cooperations throughout the burn program. It means robust funding for programs such as the regional information sharing system, risk, and dramatically improving cooperation efforts and a specialized meth training provided through the program such as the Center for Drug Task Force Training. RIS is the information sharing intelligence highway that is available to thousands of enforcement agencies across the country. This program has proven effective over many of the years and investment is a result of the cooperation of more effective enforcement. 
The state of Indiana, Indiana established a methamphetamine abuse drug task force, which a copy is attached to my testimony for your review. This task force was organized in July of 2004 and represents law enforcement agencies, youth services, and family and social services. As, a law, as law enforcement officers, we are sworn to protect the citizens. As we continue to fight growth in meth abuse and production, strong federal support for meth enforcement, training, and equipment is absolutely critical. But now most of the people understand the meth problem, but we in law enforcement know that what it takes to make real progress against it. Thank you, Chairman Souter, for seeking our input, and I look forward to continuing and providing any guidance you and your staff in need. So, uh, George Colby, thank you. Thank you, and as we tackle this difficult uh, issue, as we have done uh, in um, a couple of other hearings, it's important we hear what impact it has on other, uh, as well, people who aren't part, uh, not everybody who, in fact, a very small percentage who use uh, pseudoephedrine, uh, uh, are in fact uh, drug addicts. And uh, our first witness in this group is Mr. Joseph Heron, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs of Marsh Supermarkets, on behalf of the Food Marketing Institute, another Hoosier, uh, and representing a Hoosier firm that's a, a longtime family uh, uh, grocery business that's expanded uh, across the state of Indiana. Mr. Chairman and members, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I'm Joseph R. Herons. I am the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs from our supermarkets headquartered in Indianapolis, Indiana. My statement today is on behalf of our supermarkets and the Food Marketing Institute. To effectively combat the illegal diversion of chemical precursors, we need a comprehensive strategy and partnership between law enforcement, our regulatory agencies, manufacturers, and the retail community. But we have serious concerns about imposing stringent controls on precursors at the retail level. I am specifically referring to the Oklahoma law that relegates cough and cold products to Schedule 5 status. Under the Oklahoma model, only stores that have a pharmacy department are allowed to sell these products, and these products must be kept behind the pharmacy counter. For our industry, a Schedule 5 approach is very troublesome. That's because an overwhelming majority of grocery stores in the United States do not have a pharmacy department. For example, my company currently operates approximately 120 supermarkets in Indiana and Ohio, but only 46 of them have a pharmacy department. Therefore, under the Oklahoma model, more than 60% of our stores could not sell pseudoephedrine products that our customers expect us to carry to meet their shopping needs. At the national level, 79% of grocery stores do not have an in-store pharmacy. In other words, four out of every five grocery stores in the United States would be taken in large part out of the cough and cold business. Of our 46 stores with pharmacy departments, store hours are quite different from hours of operation in the pharmacy department. Most of our stores are open 24 hours to serve our customers who shop at all hours of the day and night. In comparison, our pharmacy departments are typically open less than 12 hours on weekdays and less than eight hours on the weekends. Therefore, even if the store is open for business, if the pharmacy department is closed or if the pharmacist is not on duty, sales of cough and cold products would not be permitted and our customers would have to shop elsewhere to, need, to meet their needs in this respect. This causes us great concern. A Schedule 5 approach would also present a number of operational challenges for pharmacy departments and grocery stores. For example, the average Mars supermarket typically carries on its retail shelves more than 150 types of cough and cold products. If we have to keep these products behind the pharmacy counter, my company would likely have to reduce the number of these products to no more than a few dozen. This is due to space limitations in the existing pharmacy departments. As such, a Schedule 5 classification would mean less choice for our customers as well as dramatically reduced customer access. It is also likely that Schedule 5 would force my company to spend a lot of money on construction to reconfigure our store layouts to make the pharmacy departments larger in order to facilitate new workflow and to accommodate the relocation and placement of these products behind the pharmacy counter. Additionally, Schedule 5 restrictions raise quality of care issues for our pharmacy operations. Under Schedule 5, only the pharmacist or the pharmacy technician would be permitted to sell these products, which means less time for them to carry out their primary professional duties of preparing and dispensing prescriptions and consulting with patients about the safe and effective use of their prescription medications. Schedule 5 poses problems for supermarket companies and their customers who have a legitimate need for these products in order to treat their coughs and colds. There would be reduced customer access and customer inconvenience 
because their local grocery store, which they shop more than two times each week, would not be allowed to sell these products, or if it contained a pharmacy department, would be allowed to sell these products, but only behind the pharmacy counter. Schedule 5 may also mean higher prices because sales would be restricted and the pharmacist would be required to ask for photo ID and have the customer sign a written log. And finally, Schedule 5 could not come at a more inopportune time with the current flu vaccine shortages here in the United States. The supermarket industry applauds the work of the law enforcement community in its efforts against methamphetamine, but we do not believe Schedule 5 is the right solution. Instead, we advocate for a more comprehensive approach for reducing methamphetamine production, trafficking, and abuse. In this regard, the supermarket industry strongly supports the following initiatives. First, elimination of the blister pack exemption. Second, a national uniformity threshold sales limit of six grams. Third, greater regulatory authority controls tracking and quota limits over imports and the sale of bulk chemicals of ephedrine and pseudoephedrine. Fourth, a ban on internet sales of precursor chemicals. Fifth, promotion and funding of educational training programs for store employees concerning suspicious pseudoephedrine purchases, i.e. the Meth Watch program. Sixth, stiffer penalties for the manufacturing, distribution, and possession of methamphetamine. And seventh, greater federal regulatory authority, including licensing and inspection at the distributor level, especially secondary wholesalers. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement, and thank you for allowing me to participate in this important hearing. Thank you very much. Our next witness is Dr. Linda, is it Sudam? Uh, president of the Consumer Healthcare Products Association. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Chairman Souter and Ranking Member, Member Cummings, thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today. I am Linda Sudan, President of the Consumer Healthcare Products Association, a 123-year-old trade association representing the manufacturers of over-the-counter medicines and nutritional supplements. Methamphetamine is a serious problem that plagues entire communities. And as we've heard in earlier testimony today, pseudoephedrine is a necessary ingredient in its manufacture. CHPA is deeply concerned that safe and effective medicines that are purchased by millions of consumers each year to treat symptoms of colds, allergies, asthma, and the flu are being diverted to manufacture meth in small clandestine labs. We are committed to the need for strong action to prevent the diversion of these important medicines to the illegal manufacture of methamphetamine. According to the DEA, these small clandestine labs account for about 20% of the meth supply in this country, and yet that small number causes significant problems for communities. We believe that, however, that the only way to significantly address the meth production and abuse is through a multifaceted approach that empowers communities to deal with all aspects of the problem. We encourage tough, comprehensive measures to attack the meth problem at every level of its manufacture and abuse, including limiting the number of packages a consumer can purchase at one time, enacting severe penalties for those manufacturing and selling meth, especially those endangering children, strengthening law enforcement resources and providing them with the tools to take action against the ma major traffickers who fuel the meth supply and as well, the meth cooks who threaten the safety of communities. And we need more programs focusing on prevention and education like Meth Watch. Mr. Chairman, we know you support Meth Watch and we applaud the introduction of your bill, which would authorize federal funding for this effective program. Implementation of Meth Watch has resulted in a dramatic reduction in theft of products used to make meth. It is now established in nine states and more are on the way. Comprehensive efforts are working in other states facing this epidemic. According to EPIC data, meth lab busts have been decreased since 2001 in Washington, Oregon, and Kansas, all of which have meth watch programs in place. And California has seen a dramatic reduction in labs due to an aggressive system of tracking and monitoring of meth precursors, mandatory registration of wholesalers and distributors, retail sales restrictions, and aggressive law enforcement and prosecution. These proven approaches should be adopted by all 50 states. At the federal level, we need to put more resources into stopping the demand for methamphetamine and stopping meth from coming into this country. The ONDCP re recently issued a plan to address meth. 
CHPA applauds the administration for the development of that plan, and we agree with many of its recommendations. All of these efforts are encouraging and will help reduce the meth problem in our communities. It is imperative that we work together toward achieving the same goal. Some, however, are now calling for a different approach. They propose to make pseudoephedrine a Schedule V drug. At first glance, putting these medications behind the counter might sound sensible. But before we embrace a single-step approach that ignores the totality of this abuse problem and restricts access for consumers who need these medicines, we need to make sure that it is truly an effective solution. We believe it is not. Like everyone who's testified here today, I believe that any decrease in meth lab bus is commendable. The OBM lab numbers are important if they continue to go down, but the Oklahoma law has only been in effect for a few months, and there are conflicting statistics that indicate it is too early to draw sweeping conclusions. Compared with the concrete data that indicates significant lab reductions in Kansas, Washington, Oregon, and California, it begs the question on the effectiveness of the Oklahoma approach and the long-term effectiveness on reducing meth use in general. Over-the-counter medicines remain important to our healthcare system. A recent study by Northwestern University concluded that OTC cough and cold medicines saves the U.S. economy and our healthcare system almost $5 billion a year. Furthermore, OTC medicines serve a critical public health need, a fact that will likely be drawn into sharp focus given the flu vaccine shortage this year. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, as great as it might sound, there is no quick fix to this complex problem. We must take a comprehensive approach that works, not half measures that have a greater impact on sick kids, caregivers, and flu sufferers than on criminals. We must all work together with all the resources that are available to us. We look forward to working with you and continuing our efforts to fight methamphetamine at every level. Thank you. Our, thank you very much. Our, uh, Cleanup witness, uh, so to speak, would be Ms. Marianne Wagner, Vice President of the Pharmacy, Regulatory Affairs, National Association of Chain Drug Stores. Good morning, Chairman Souter and Ranking Member Cummings. My name is Marianne Wagner, and I'm Vice President of Pharmacy Regulatory Affairs at NACDS. I'm a pharmacist licensed in the state of Indiana. I think I'm the third Hoosier here on the panel. <laughs> uh, I served as a member of the Indiana Board of Pharmacy from 1988 to 1996. <coughs> NACDS commends Chairman Souter for his leadership in addressing the methamphetamine problem. We appreciate the opportunity to testify today before this committee as you examine the ways the federal government can assist law enforcement in the fight against methamphetamine. Our membership consists of more than 200 chain community pharmacy companies operating over 33,000 pharmacies. Collectively, chain pharmacy comprises the largest component of pharmacy practice with over 100,000 pharmacists. Our pharmacies fill over 70% of the 3 billion prescriptions dispensed annually in the United States. Our membership is deeply concerned about the problems of methamphetamine production and abuse. We have ongoing calls and meetings to discuss this issue and to develop solutions to this devastating problem in our country. The majority of our members have taken voluntary, proactive steps that go beyond what is required by their state law to reduce the theft and illegitimate use of pseudoephedrine products. Among, among other things, they have initiated voluntary sales limits of these products, participate in voluntary education and theft deterrent programs like MethWatch, train their employees on methamphetamine abuse, and work with law enforcement by reporting suspicious activity in their stores. We want to continue to work with DEA and law enforcement to reduce the illicit meth production in the United States, but we also want to balance those efforts with our ability to provide access to OTC products for legitimate consumers and to optimize the skills of the pharmacist and the pharmacy staff that we employ. The new Oklahoma law is not only operationally difficult for our members to comply with, but we also have some very serious concerns as to why the law appears to be reducing the clandestine labs in the state when in fact the same results could be accomplished without the extreme measures that were taken in Oklahoma. Since other states are now looking to Oklahoma in Schedule 5 as the model, we appreciate the opportunity to state our reasons why we question the effectiveness of the Oklahoma law and oppose making pseudoephedrine a Schedule 5 substance. First, we have found no reliable statistics or data to support the statements that the law has been successful or is the optimal approach. 
For this reason, we are pursuing independent verification of the anecdotal statistics that appear to point to a reduction in the methamphetamine labs. Second, under the law in Oklahoma, those who have been arrested for methamphetamine-related crimes must appear before a magistrate, judge, or court who are likely to deny bond. Had this law been in effect a year ago, the addict, addict who killed the state trooper there would have been behind bars rather than back on the streets to commit a senseless killing. Third, we are concerned about the effect that classifying pseudoephedrine as a Schedule V controlled substance would have on the practice of pharmacy and the services that we provide. Requiring pharmacists to perform the duties of a sales clerk would not be an efficient use of their time, training, or knowledge. Time spent tracking cold medicine sales is time not spent practicing pharmacy. We believe that any benefits achieved under the Oklahoma law could be replicated in other states without the unnecessary burdens of Schedule V requirements. Registration of non-pharmacy retailers who sell pseudoephedrine products would drastically reduce the caseloads of product being sold out the back doors of rogue convenience stores and gas stations. Raising barriers for, consumer, for consumers to access pseudoephedrine products is a short-term solution to a long-term problem. The methamphetamine problem in this country goes beyond toxic lab investigation and cleanup. And we don't mean to minimize the seriousness of the problems these labs pose for law enforcement and the communities affected. However, we must also pursue long-term solutions to the methamphetamine problem that reduce the demand for illicit substances. So in conclusion, if the federal government is serious about reducing the methamphetamine problem, we would recommend a number of opportunities be explored, some of which are stiff penalties for those arrested or convicted of methamphetamine-related offenses, encouraging states to register non-pharmacy retailers that sell pseudoephedrine products, significantly increasing funding for methamphetamine abuse prevention and treatment programs, working with the State Department and officials in chemical producing countries to more closely track every sale of pseudoephedrine in the United, into the United States, providing incentives for drug companies to develop an effective decongestant that cannot be converted into methamphetamine, providing more funding and resources to DEA for enforcement activities and to local law enforcement for lab cleanup. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. We thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing, and we look forward to working with all present today to find effective solutions to the methamphetamine problem. We look forward to sharing with you the research and data that we are pursuing in the hope of providing further evidence to help us develop meaningful solutions for addressing these problems. First, I want to thank everybody for their testimony, and, and uh, since this is uh, in narcotics and enforcement, arguably one of the hottest uh, debates that's occurring at the state and, and federal level. It's really helpful to have um, all of you on the same panel. Too often uh, we he have uh, disconnects. We hear something on one side and hear something on the other side and you go to one place and go, that sounds really good, and you go somewhere else, that sounds really good. And uh, uh, this gives us a chance for a little extended discussion. I have some other questions beyond this for this panel, but let me, uh, uh, plunge right into this. Uh, Mr. Wright, clearly you've heard these discussions in Oklahoma as you went through the law. There were a number of, of a whole range of, of concerns uh, uh, from uh, pharmacy hours and the impact on the grocery store to uh, pharmacists being uh, professionals to, to uh, let's just stick with those once in a while uh, for a start here. Um, did you look at treating this more like cigarettes? where it would be behind the counter but not have to be a pharmacy uh, and somebody might have to show a license uh, and be limited in the quantity they buy as opposed to treating it as a Schedule Five and putting it in a pharmacy? Yes, sir, that uh, was discussed but not seriously considered. We already have a, an industry and an institution in, in Oklahoma, that's the pharmacy, where we regulate uh, drugs. All drugs and pharmacies are regulated by government because of some sort of need. We thought that pseudoephedrine belonged in, in a pharmacy. Did, um, did you hear when you were developing the law the concerns from the grocery stores uh, and from the pharmacists as well as the pharmaceutical companies? No, sir, we didn't hear so much uh, from the retailers in Oklahoma. Uh, initially, they were a little bit concerned, but we had a number of instances where uh, independent uh, convenience store operators were making as much as $70,000 in, in a six-month period when they made $5,000 selling Coca-Cola products. 
the, the, some of those stores are clearly making uh, an awful lot of money selling pseudoephedrine to methamphetamine addicts. And um, uh, the, it's, we don't regulate those people and, and it, it appeared to us to be very difficult to do that. Uh, Mr. Heron, could you, um, that uh, in the, compared to a, uh, a small uh, one person convenience store or grocery store, your firm would be huge compared to some other supermarket chains, you're small, uh, that um, in, in looking at the, the challenge here, we heard um, from uh, a representative at the uh, hearing in Hawaii that was very concerned um, because there they have lots of small towns and by definition every pharmacy and grocery store is small. Uh, they don't even have scanners. Um, at the same time, in Indiana, one of the problems we see with the uh, pseudoephedrine and ephedrine precursors, we've even seen uh, at least one case in my district of somebody getting a pharmacy license uh, and predominantly to be able to deal with biker gangs uh, and that uh, much of like what we see uh, in um, uh, and just heard about Oklahoma is coming from a, a lot of wherever they see a vulnerability, they'll go and hit that store. Uh, how, how do you respond a little bit uh, specifically to what Mr. Wright uh, said? That in fact, um, it's undeniable that there are certain places where they're loading up. No, there's no, there's no question it's a serious problem. And, and Indiana does have a problem like many states. We have this summer in July of 2004, the creation of the Meth Abuse Task Force which is making recommendations to the Indiana General Assembly. Uh, many of the recommendations that have been discussed at this table today. But I think as, uh, as you've heard, I know Sheriff Bundy, I was encouraged to hear what he had to say because he said that the retail community in his state was very cooperative. As we have become familiar, especially over the last year, of a serious problem in Indiana, our community, the retail community, is stepping up and trying to be a part of the solution. And one of the things we've been talking about in an organization in Indiana called the Indiana Retail Council, which is a trade organization for retailers, we talked about this actually last month as well as earlier this week, is what can we do to, uh, to try to have a positive impact? And you've heard some of the things that we've outlined. Uh, elimination of the blister pack, limiting the, the amount of, of products to six grams, maybe stronger sentencing. Uh, those are some of the things that, that we think will make uh, a difference here constructive, positive steps, but not drastic steps um, that, that may not be warranted. Um, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, rural areas, in terms of specific pockets of problems, I'm not sure in the state of Indiana, as you know, it's mostly an agricultural state with a few large cities, um, in terms of dealing with pockets, or, or I think you talked about a license in, in the biker gangs. Um, uh, I'm not sure what the solution to that is, except enforcement of the law once that becomes known um, and putting those kind of people out of business. And then in Indiana, one of the things that I think is coming is, is again, a limitation on the, the, the amount that you can buy two or three products per transaction, a, as well as uh, elimination of the blister pack and some other things. The, uh, I think you also had in your recommendations with wholesalers. Yes. How do you see that? Uh, um, rather than ask you that question, Mr. Wright, do you believe this problem could be addressed by wholesalers uh, looking at unusual quantities going out of proportion, like the person that said they were selling more than Coca-Cola? You could look at that and say it's a how, how much of an auditing problem is that? That's a tremendous problem for us, and, and when it's widespread, and, and it apparently is. And also, I might add that. I don't think that uh, three pack per limits work. We have that self-imposed by Walmart in Oklahoma. We've got videotape after videotape where people uh, get out of a car, four or five of them, they all go buy three packs, they go back to the car, they go buy three more packs, they come back, they go to some other Walmart, they're doing the same thing. Well, we really work just trying to keep pseudofedrin out of the manufacturer's hands and, and we don't think that's a viable solution. Can they do that through uh, a Schedule Five drug by going to different uh, pharmacies? Right now they can, but when we implement our uh, statewide computer system that will uh, authorize those threshold limits, uh, they won't be able to do that. And as we speak, uh, pharmacies in small communities particularly are networking with each other and showing law their logbooks to law enforcement who are comparing names to see who's 
uh, presently trying to purchase more than the nine gram limit. So have we're making some arrests already. Have you seen anything move to internet? No, I have not. Mr. Cummings, do you have? I am um, so glad that we had the both. Uh, I agree with the chairman. It's I was feeling pretty good about you for a while then, Mr. Wright. And then these folks came along and then it just was a clash because I can see both sides of the issue. So, and I looked at the, uh, Mr. Haram, I was looking at your recommendations. I was trying to figure out what do we do to try to, um, at the same time, maintain the convenience for customers and for you, Ms. Wagner, and you, Ms. Saddam, but at the same time deal with the problem. And, and as I was listening to all of you, I can understand why um, you all may have had the success that you had in getting this passed um, and, and not so much opposition, not as much as Sam seems to be growing. Part of it is what Mr. Harens said, that is that they're figuring out what happened and they're seeing the effect. The other part of it is that probably the problem was so overwhelming in your jurisdiction that people said, well, we don't care about the convenience. We'd rather deal with the problem because I, you know, I'm just guessing. <clears throat> but now we're at a point where some kind of way we, we're trying to find a solution to this problem. And Mr. Wright, when you hear what has been said, we usually don't have this kind of exchange, so I've got to take advantage of it. You've heard the arguments here. I mean, what, what's your response to that? I mean, what you understand what they're saying. Yes, sir. And it's reasonable. I, do you agree? Uh, I don't think that it is. You don't think it's reasonable? No, sir. Okay, why don't you go ahead? I've been a policeman for 25 years. I go back into those phenyl acidic <coughs> acid laboratories. I've seen the carnage associated with uh, uh, the abuse of methamphetamine, and, and you clearly understand it. What we're really weighing here is treating the sniffles versus uh, solving this problem. In my opinion, and as a, as a police officer, personally speaking, I would rather solve the problem at, at minor inconvenience to, to people uh, with nasal congestion. I think it's a very good trade. Uh, the people of Oklahoma seem to think so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, officer, Sheriff, I'm sorry, Sheriff Bundy, um, the meth watch program. I mean, that's, uh, as I listened to you, I couldn't help but figure, I, I just tried to think like these manufacturers think. First of all, they understand that it is a truly a thin blue line. And if, if you're a manuf if a person's a manufacturer, knowing there's a thin blue line and it's even thinner in rural areas, it seems as if they would say to themselves, well, this is a situation where we probably have more of an opportunity to get away with it. Is that a, I mean, that, that's what they might say. I'm not saying that's true, but that's what they may conclude. It is true. And yeah. That, that uh, I mean, that fact is just really enhanced by the truth that we don't have 24-hour police patrol um, we're abutted by more urban areas, so rural counties are attractive to these individuals for all those very reasons. And, and the honest answer is yes, more often than not, they are able to come to rural areas of America and get away with it. And then when I hear you go into a small lab for nine hours, I mean, and the overwhelming nature of that in, on a small police force has got to be just absolutely devastating. And I'm just trying to figure out, I mean, with all of you, I mean, we are all reasonable people, and I'm just trying to figure, you all listened to uh, Mr. Haran, Haran, I don't know why I can't pronounce your name. Nobody can. Oh, okay, good. I feel better now. You heard his suggestions, and you heard uh, Ms. Wagner and Dr. Sudam. I mean, and I understand what you said. Officer Wright, and I respect that. I, I have a tremendous, I, I support police officers. And I, I, I really do because I know how important your job is. So how do we now, with all of this, 
come up with, I mean, you heard, heard the suggestions. I mean, what, what is reasonable, I mean, what, what would, I mean, what, what do you all suggest we do hearing everything that you've heard? I mean, from my police side, I mean, what, because you all are going to, I mean, this, this, these arguments are going to be made. I can tell you, I can hear them. They were, and by the way, extremely well done, both sides, extremely well done. We have two, we have two major problems. Um, and I guess it all depends on who's uh, observing one, one may see, feel like one problem is, is worse than the other and far outweighs the other, and so we should have a certain solution. Then, then there's the other side. So where do we, where's the middle? I mean, what do you see that we could do to kind of come, kind of meet all of you all's hopes and dreams that we deal with this problem, but at the same time, not inconvenience and folks to the degree that might be unreasonable? Anybody on? I know where you you you, you stand, uh, Mr. Wright. <laughs> Sheriff, I I believe there's a lot of pieces that have to come together, and I think there can be some very productive partnerships formed um, from law enforcement, from retailers, through communities. Uh, I think everybody's coming to a greater appreciation of the scope of this problem, and we we recognize it as being a true problem, and uh, the Oklahoma approach is working for Oklahoma. It may work other places. Uh, something of a smaller scale may work other places. I, I don't know the answer, no, no better than you do, I guess, or anyone here at the panel, but it's my belief and, and my experience after all these years and just the countless cases um, that it's gonna have to be a partnership that involves the community and law enforcement and retailers that all play a big role in this, comes together to formulate a workable solution that we can all be uh, happy with. You know, Mr. Yeah, sure. Just, just for the record, um, I come from a small town of 700, but it's in a big county. Uh, that, um, and the smallest county I represent is about 40,000 people. You said your county had 10,000 in it total? Yes, sir. Um, it, is it a somewhat unique situation in a sense, do you have much mobility in and out of the county? I mean, do you pretty much know everybody in the county? Yes. So it becomes a little bit, it comes a little bit easier challenge to work with a grocery store or a pharmacy where you know everybody. Is that fair That's to say? tremendous strength in programs such as Meth Watch, yes. And, and a long time ago, I remember early in my career as sheriff from Wichita, which is our urban area in Kansas, talking about how the best way to really solve problems uh, starts just like that. It's, it's a, a neighbor to neighbor thing, and then it's a block to block thing, and then it goes from community to community to encompass a county, was uh, the story he related. And that's very much how it does work, and that's my experience, that I've got to sell the neighborhoods on it, and then they sell the blocks, and then the blocks, the communities, and the communities, the counties, and the counties, the states, and, and right up the chain to where we really come up with some, some tremendous solutions. But, that's the grassroots approach I take with problems. In this instance, it's proven to be really effective in trying to manage our methamphetamine problem. You know, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> I was just thinking that, you know, the, the way law enforcement, I, 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 I'm a lawyer, and before I came here, I practiced for about 19 years, a small practice. And, but the way most people got caught in criminal situations that somebody told on them or else they told on themselves. And, um, you know, I was just thinking, you got to, we have to maximize that cooperation. I guess the Meth Watch program aims at doing that. And I was thinking about the communities, the drug free communities piece. You know, I, maybe we need to look at that and see. I, I just, I've got to go back and look at it, whether there are things that we can do to enhance that to help some of this, you know, do some of this prevention and addressing these community needs. Because it's got to be, it's, we've got to, uh, Sheriff, going back to what you just said, we almost have to try to do everything in our power to do this uh, almost by community by community. And perhaps having <coughs> um, the, uh, drug stores and others who may sell these products help us in any way that they can to try to address this problem. Um, one thing is for sure, 
you know, Martin Luther King Sr. said, Jr. said, you cannot lead where you do not go, and you cannot teach what you don't know. That's why I appreciate what, what the law enforcement side says so much, because I know that when you see the carnage, when you see the jail filled, I mean, it's like, this is what you've got to deal with every day. And I guess after you've seen it, Sheriff Bundy, for 20 years plus, and then you see generation after generation, you're saying, well, you know, I got to do, I, I mean, and I don't want you to give up. And I'm thinking about, I'm just imagining somebody sitting right now watching this on C-SPAN and saying, um, okay, let's go and do this because we there is this thin blue line. So I, I, I just think we've got to figure out a way. We've got to look on this, we in the Congress have got to just try to figure out how we can empower communities more and at the same time uh, try to bring uh, folks together, both the retailers and, and others who may have a problem with some of these solutions and you all so that we can can lift our whole communities up because it's we can't we can't just sit here and do I mean I, I'm not saying that we're not doing things because we've already heard that testimony but I just can't believe that we can't do more so I just don't believe it and so um, anybody may want to comment and then I'll be finished please turn on your mic what Two of the suggestions that, that we made, I think, are something that could be done quite easily and would make a difference. One is um, limiting or eliminating the blister pack uh, rule as it stands today and in, in uh, starting sales limits within retail stores. But even more than that, limiting the number of stores that carry the products. Um, right now, all pharmacies are licensed by their state board of pharmacy. They know who those pharmacies are, they go out, they regularly inspect them. When it comes to selling this particular product, we find it in convenience stores and gas stations, and that's where some of the real problems are happening. Um, we don't necessarily believe in limiting stores that can carry it, but at least if they're not licensed by the Board of Pharmacy, let them register so that some entity in the state knows who's selling it and can go and inspect those premises, look at their invoices, look at their records. Right now, there is no one body overseeing the non-pharmacy retailers. And that's something that could be done quite easily, quite quickly, and it would at least give us more knowledge of where these problems are occurring. Does that hurt you, uh, Mr. Hearns? I don't believe it does. Mm -hmm. um, I happen to think that's probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, so that still would allow Mars to, you said I think a large percentage of your stores don't have a pharmacy. Right. So products that would fall under that category, they would, in, in your suggestion, they would have to still register, although they don't have a, because they don't have a pharmacy, and the ones that have a pharmacy, they already right. regulate it. It would give them the much. opportunity to register, but I would imagine that the rogue operators aren't going to do that. They do not want regulators knowing who they are and that mm -hmm. they're selling caseloads out the back door. So this would legitimize those retailers who carry the product. They could mm -hmm. still have it available for legitimate customers, but at least an entity in the state would know who and where these people are. They're selling yeah. it. Well, I just want to, again, thank all of you for what you're doing. Um, this is a major problem. It's, it's, uh, it is one of the most, uh, one of the reasons why I agreed to do this subcommittee is to, because I see the pain of drugs every day. We don't have the methamphetamine problem in Baltimore too much where I am from, but no matter what the drug is, the pain, I mean, it's just so painful to see how people are destroyed. And um, so we're going to do the best we can. We want to work with you. And I'm, I, I am curious, Mr. Wright, I, Mr. Chairman, I hope that we can revisit uh, a year from now uh, Mr. Wright's Oklahoma's situation. And one of the things, too, that I saw as a problem, and, and you alluded to it, Sheriff Bundy, is that when you have an Oklahoma law, then does that then force people into an adjourn, you know, the next state or surrounding states? 
And it seems to me that you might have to even get, so therefore what would happen is you almost have to have a national law because then people just move from state to state to state. And then possibly an adjoining, adjoining state then gets a bigger problem. I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure about the answers to that, but I know that in almost everything else, um, just like most states, they, they, when they look at something like cigarette tax and things of that nature, they worry about those things because they don't want to, you know, they force people into another state. And so I think that's, those are the things that we have to, and I, to, 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 to consider. And the fact is, is that maybe the federal, there is a role for the federal government to play. We want to play our role, but we also want to be supportive of our states and our locals. And so we will give it the best we, we can. And we just thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Saddam, do, do you agree about with the eliminating the blister pack? Food marketing said they did, the Association of Chain Drug Stores. What's your association position? Yes, we agree with that as well. In fact, I agree with uh, all of the points that uh, that Ms. Wagner made and, um, and Mr. Herons. Uh, we, we, we believe that registration will be a, a, an important factor in limiting uh, sales to the legitimate uh, groceries and to the legitimate pharmacies and get rid of these rogue places where the product is going out the back door. But, you know, one other thing we haven't mentioned, Mr. Chairman, and I know this is a law enforcement hearing, but I do think we have to focus on prevention as well. And <clears throat> I think um, we have done some work with the Partnership for Drug Free America that looks at how do you raise awareness about the problem of methamphetamine addiction and, in fact, how you can raise awareness with um, parents and with pediatricians and children and not to get people to stop using this because we've, we've heard from all the law enforcement people how addictive this drug is and how you cannot, in many cases, be treated because there's not an effective treatment. So we think a major effort needs to be in the prevention area as well. And we also, but we also agree that we need to enforce the law, we need to strengthen our laws, and we need um, to, to make the other uh, retail restrictions that we've talked about and registration. That, um, I want to comment just briefly on what you said, because this committee deals, we probably 60% at least of our work is with narcotics, so we have lots of different things, as you heard today, even segment further the meth in, in future hearings. But uh, I want to touch briefly on the prevention side. It is, um, I talked to Director Walters just last Friday about this very subject, about using some of the ad campaign on meth. But here's our, our fundamental problem. There is no meth addict who didn't start with marijuana, period. We have had multiple uh, testimony around the country about polydrug use and other things, but if we don't get a hold of the marijuana problem, we don't tackle the meth problem. And everybody likes to talk about meth, but they don't want to talk about marijuana. The fact is, is that our national ad campaign, combined with other efforts, have reduced marijuana use in the United States the last two years in a row. So guess what Congress is about to do in its infinite wisdom, to my great frustration, and the problem is the other body, as we say here. They are reducing the national ad campaign. We have consistently reduced it now for three straight years. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Cummings and myself, along with uh, Speaker Hastert, have worked, and Chairman Istook has held a higher number in the House, but we are battling to keep that program alive. Partnership for Drug Free America does a great job, but without some of this national ad campaign, if we further divide a limited amount of dollars in basic advertising, which you all know in your industries, if you go below a certain threshold, you might as well not do the program because it, unless there's enough repetitions and enough penetration of the market, and so if we segment this by drugs, we'll lose the momentum we have in one and not get the other one started, and I am, exasperated, and I hope the speaker succeeds here in the next 48 hours of getting this dollar amount back up, or we are in big trouble in our number one prevention program. Our second big prevention program, Safe and Drug Free Schools, has been so watered down in so many districts, they use it for any, you know, any after school program because maybe it'll make the kids think that they're not gonna get involved in drugs, and it was supposed to be an anti-drug program. So when we actually talk about prevention programs in the United States, we don't have many. Partnership for Drug Free America is a great program. The community uh, drug coalitions are, but we have reduced uh, the uh, uh, kind of the thrust of what we've been doing a lot at, at this in spite of this committee's effort to, to highlight it. And I have a, a couple of other uh, specific questions. I wondered, Mr. Wright, what was your reaction to the licensing of a lot of these smaller operations 
um, would they go out if they were monitored more closely and would that give us another way to handle it? I don't really know the answer to that. Our, what we looked at is we already have a body where we keep drugs that need to be uh, protected and that's the pharmacy. Uh, it might be worth exploring, uh, but you know. So you basically knocked out convenience stores and anybody else from being able to sell the type of products you described if they didn't have a pharmacy? Yes. Um, that, um, that still left uh, j liquid gel caps and, and, and liquid preparations in the convenience stores. Those are products that we don't see in methamphetamine laboratories. This is a, a huge question, and we're talking about meth today, but we had a hearing in Orlando on, on Oxycontin and orthodones. Similar argument, uh, similar debate uh, that uh, the, as DEA re consistently reports, the number one cause of drug deaths in the United States is legal drugs, uh, and that uh, there is continuing pressure to try to figure out how to get a hold of this. Uh, we've had this rash of Oxycontin. We picked up the main guy uh, or group in, in my area on Oxycontin uh, in Orlando. I mean, it went through one high school, killed 10 kids like that. How do you balance that with pain relief? Uh, that um, these are, are huge questions, not just in the meth precursors. I want to make sure I get on the record here, uh, Lieutenant Colby, um, that because we got mostly on this subject, but this hearing is also dealing with a, a, a broader range. Burn grants are proposed to be cut, and I don't believe at the end of the day they'll be cut. Could you describe because, uh, what would happen if burn grants are cut as it relates to you, and I'd be interested in hearing the other law enforcement uh, people say that too. Certainly. Uh, as I said in my statement, we have 34 drug task force grants in the state of Indiana that are multi-jurisdictional. It's one of the requirements through the Indiana Criminal Justice Institute that sends out the burns monies. One of the problems is, is one-third of the narcotics officers in the state of Indiana will be unemployed if the burns grants go away. I personally, from the, a large county of Allen County, and we have 350,000 people in our county, my unit is seven people. Well, that's our responsibility. Plus, I picked up Huntington County, Huntington City, and two other counties that work with us on knocking off meth labs and so on. I personally, we don't get met, uh, involved in their meth labs as much as they take care of that, and we try to help them taking care of their cocaine and crackhead problem. So it's kind of a tit-for-tat thing. Their funds are getting ate up because of it. Well, I try to help them out out of the drug task force funds. So the Burns grants are doing a multi thing in, in everybody's area. And the Indiana Drug Enforcement Asso Officers Association, you know, we're, we're saying one of the problems we have with meth is as officers, as all of you know, law enforcement officers really don't see a lot of gray. It's black or white, and you either go to jail or you don't. And uh, I think that's one of the stances that Oklahoma took. Uh, it's not a patch, it's a fix, and they're getting results, and it's not tomorrow or a year from now, it's today. And I think that's one of the big problems that you're going to see with the battle that you people have, unfortunately. And I don't have to, to mess with that. So, Mr. Wright, could you describe what would happen if uh, burn grants would go away or get dramatically reduced? Burn grants are essential to Oklahoma. More than half of the narcotics agents in the, our state are funded uh, by burn funds. Uh, they operate uh, 27 independent drug task forces, uh, and particularly in rural areas. Uh, that has been the single group that has fought this methamphetamine epidemic uh, for the last decade. Those guys do more meth labs in Oklahoma than anyone else, uh, and, and we're going to be in real trouble uh, if, if we lose burn funding. We lobby for that hard every year. It also funds uh, a wire intercept project that we have at my agency. We, we don't just work meth labs, we work Mexican drug cartel cell groups that are operative in Oklahoma, and we do wiretap after wiretap after wiretap on those organizations, and, and all of those cases lead back to Mexico. That's also burn funded. Uh, we very much appreciate burn funding. One of the things that's, that's happening that we have to, to watch uh, is, is that the high-intensity drug trafficking areas, the HIDAs, had a very specific goal. That goal was to work in high-intensity drug trafficking areas to keep the drugs from getting to other areas. 
and his congressmen figured out and senators uh, figured out that they could get Haidas in their home area. The Haidas became in some areas like the drug task forces. And as the Haidas proliferate, the support for burn grants has declined because Haidas became the new trend. And pretty soon, and, and uh, even though some of their function is the same and some of them aren't, what's gonna happen is if we reduce the burn grants, we are gonna see a demand for Haidas everywhere. Haidas in effect will merely become a reconfiguration of the drug task forces, which is starting to happen in some areas already in, in the country. And the whole point of a border control, high intensity distribution networks will be undermined and will have undermined the existing drug task force structure, trying to reinvent another one because we have a new hot name. And it's, it's been interesting because we haven't really looked at that uh, interrelationship between where the burn grant money is going and where the Haida money is going. Oklahoma is kind of interesting because don't you have a new Haida? Yes, sir. Um, and We're an extension of the North Texas Haida out of Dallas. Which is a relatively low funded Haida, so you don't have a as very much low pressure, funded Haida. Much pressure, but it's that type of trend that as that expands, there will be more attention on that money and trying to get that money and we just move it from one to the other and don't get it a net in a reconfiguration. So I wanted to make sure we got under the record here about the burn grants and we're similar looking at, at risk versus epic and so on. Did you have something, Sheriff Bundy? Just real quickly about the burn grants. And I just met with the director of the Candace Brew investigation last week and, and the trend, and it's just become, it's the only way the KBI exists is 46% of that budget is from federal funding now. And in a state like ours that is so rural, we're 75% a representative of me, um, we don't have narcotics officers or detectives. We rely on the state agency being the KBI for that type of support for the entire state. So the elimination of burn grants, not only it, it wouldn't so much impact narcotics investigations or specialized services, but the most basic type of services to the citizens of our state would be impacted that day that burn grants uh, are lessened. So it, it plays a huge role in rural states, and I, hate, I would hate for you not to know of that. Well, I, I thank you um, all for your testimony today, for your uh, participation. Uh, we and many other members of Congress and the Speaker's Drug Task Force are trying to put together a package here. We're trying to work with everybody involved as to how we do this at the national level. We all know the internet and international sales complicate all these questions, uh, so we don't just move it to another place. Uh, uh, we want to work with the industry, we want to work with law enforcement to make sure that we can uh, tr try to keep the meth uh, problem from expanding. Uh, we also will be working uh, while well, we're focused on this for this particular task, we're working with the industry as well on the other uh, over-the-counter uh, uh, legal drugs that are used and abused by individuals both for distribution and leading to the death and destruction of many families and individuals around the country. So once again, thank you again. Any additional materials you want to submit. We'll probably give you some additional follow-up questions, both for the record, but as we develop the package together, I'm sure that the Narcotics Officers Association, which is a key part of the support for this committee and represents the people on the front lines, as well as trying to balance that with fairness for the people who need uh, uh, legal drugs to relieve their pain and, and suffering in many different ways. Thank you all for participating. With that, the subcommittee stands adjourned.
in just a moment on C-SPAN, part of yesterday's dedication ceremony for the Clinton Presidential Library. After that, Arlen Specter's Republican colleagues on the judicial